Hello, monster fans. It's John Campbell and Brendan Jones from the show you're about to listen to. Uh, if you're smart <laughs> and if you're brave. Yes, it's a spooky, spooky show. But if you want even more spookiness, you can head over to the Punch Up Entertainment Podbean patron page. That's patron.podbean.com slash punch up, where you can binge three whole seasons of this show. Ooh, that <laughs> gotta hurt. And if you want even more spooky thrills, come by my apartment. <laughs> oh, wait, that's inappropriate. That sorry. isn't. Yeah, we've talked about this, Brendan. Uh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, uh, so you can head over there and get uh, not only full archive seasons of this very show, but you can also get the exclusive only patron show, Nights Talking, where Brendan and I walk through the adventures of Carl Kolchak, uh, where, uh, you know, we, we, we follow the Night Stalker on his many, many escapades. And if you don't know who Carl Kolchak is, why are you listening to us right now? <laughs> Very <laughs> true. Uh, so once again, that link is patron.podbean.com slash punch up. And now enjoy the spookiness. Mr. Carl Emily feels it would be a little unkind to present this picture without just a word of friendly warning. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Uh, well, we've warned you. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Campbell and Jones Meet the Monsters, the show where we watch every Universal Monster movie in chronological order. I'm John Campbell. With me as always, Brenda Jones. Hola! How are you, Mr. Campbell? I'm doing all right. How are you? Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be uh, the attitude these days for everybody who comes on the uh, any show I, that I, I do. I so wish I could spin it. I, I guess I could put put on the happy face. The days come, the days go, John, but we always have bad 1940s horror movies to rely on. It's it's true. I can count on this in my week. And, oh, no, you're already staying bad this week, which is... um, Well, like you like to do, uh, and I, I try to do, I found good in it. Yeah, but uh, uh, I will say hard. few and far between on this one, though, for me finding good in this one, even. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but this is the... Next to last invisible person film we'll ever yeah. have to watch on this yeah. podcast. Uh, and, uh, yes. Uh, we are talking about uh, inv the Invisible Man's Revenge. Yeah. I will say this time, unlike things like The Mummy's Hand, The Mummy's Tomb, all these, The Mummy's Ghost. Yeah. This one, at the title, is actually the movie. I mean, this is what... It is, is A Invisible after. Man's Revenge. Mm-hmm. A Invisible Man's Revenge <laughs> is what we were uh, banking on and what we got in 1944. Yes. Now, this time out, uh, I don't have... Uh, this is similar. Some of these, as we go on, that are not as lauded, I have a feeling, well, there'll probably be more for things like... Um, pardon me, uh, House of Frankenstein. Yeah. Just because it's, it's a monster rally film and it's the first of its kind... But th I have a feeling I'll find more. But in the case of this one, uh, hey, listen, there's really not much other than more just factoids and tidbits. So I have factoids and tidbits for yeah. the Little Man's Revenge. Right, right. Uh, do you want to give us those factoids? No, John. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and scene. And we just shut the whole thing down. You know what? Not today. <laughs> I looked him right in the eye and I said, Satan? Not today. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, yes, of course I yeah. do. I want to give some factoids. I want to start uh, <laughs> with uh, a review from uh, New York World Telegram, a, a contemporary review, just uh, to paraphrase. It says, <laughs> some of the earlier variations of H.G. Wells' Invisible Man idea 
were filmed with an idea that the story should make good sense. That policy has been abandoned this time. <laughs> uh, I have a lot uh, of questions about things that happened in this movie. So, Yeah, I do too. And actually, there are hints as to what happened, which you know I'll, I'll bring up as we go. Because it seems that some editing along the way did make this a little bit murkier than it had to be. Um, uh, and there's a couple scenes where I felt that. Like yeah, open the, where I'm like something's missing. I know it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, there are actual plot things as opposed to was it just a long conversation that we missed? No, there are things you're like going, oh, the implications here are reliant on material that has been excised. Yeah, yeah. Um, now another factoid. Uh, shortly after they announced this film in uh, June of 1943. This film came out in 44, but they announced it in 43. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get Claude Rains again. Oh, so man. they announced that they were trying to build up sort of like a demand or the sort of like, uh, oh, the buzz and we're going to get Claude back. Yeah. Claude had done Casablanca and, and other great films. He was like, no. Yeah. Oh, I don't <laughs> think so. Um... Yeah. Much, he, he wasn't very happy with the way Phantom of the Opera had gone either. Can't blame and, him. <laughs> Yeah, and he had bowed out of that sequel, which was really quasi-sequel, right. but the climax, the film yeah. that came out with Boris Karloff later. Um, so he didn't show up for that. So he said no, and they went with John Hall, our old friend, John Hall. And I want the listeners to know. Just in The Last say, Invisible Man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I say our old friend, I'm not being ironic. I really feel like these people have become our friends, John. We're, we're, I mean, look, I'm seeing them more than people I care about in my life. So, yeah. 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 There you go, I can't, John. I can't get away oh. from Evelyn Anchors. So, uh. You can't. You never will. <laughs> um, it's interesting that, I mean, it, there are, are heroines and uh, lead actresses we've experienced so far that I liked better. Yep. But I think she was just a contract gal at this point. She, she was, was around. Gal. And she was around, but she she really has never had the same impact for me as some of the others we've talked about. Some so. of that is on the scripts. I mean, this oh, this sure. one and the last. I mean, the, the la most of the ones she's in, she has nothing to do. She has nothing yeah. to do in this movie she at has all. Nothing she's to do, barely yeah. in this movie, even. Yeah, when when she and her uh, her fiance boyfriend Oof. guy show back up, like yeah. they're introduced, they, they go away for fifteen minutes or something, which in a movie this short, yeah considerable time comes when they show the... back up I'm like oh are they are they still in this <laughs> thing comes in at an epic 77 minutes mm -hmm. this one's a I, I i had to get up and stretch <laughs> um but uh and i should be doing that anyway very sedentary lifestyle these days yeah Thank i think i think a lot of people can relate yeah oof i need to save it for a peloton hey that's what we should do uh hey patreons uh <laughs> send us more money so i can buy myself one of those fancy interweb bikes <laughs> with uh live classes anyway uh so that was a tidbit uh, that cracked me up but i was saying as i was saying right before uh they announced this movie or actually shortly after they announced this movie they signed another deal with hg wells his, he him himself uh, they're like, hey, we want to renew our license Jeez. to be able to do more sequels or more spinoffs of The Invisible Man uh, from 1943, July 1943, just to some point in, in uh, 1951. What's hilarious is that means just this, <laughs> which ends up not having been such a huge hit. And then and Abbott and Costello. Abbott and Costello meet The Invisible Man. And guess what year that came out? Uh, it's a lot after this. Yeah. 19, they scooted it in yeah. right before they lost it. They're like, oh, shit, we haven't done anything with that. Ah. But, also, I was, Bud and Lou, do you want to meet the Invisible Man? I think it probably went down <laughs> like that. Like, over there goes like, oh, my God, this is running out. Bud, Lou, meet the Invisible Man. <laughs> nice to meet you. They filmed it. That was it. Yeah. Um. So that, that cracked me up. And apparently that extension of the rights, $7,500. <laughs> For less than you could buy a car right now, you yeah. could have gotten the rights to the Invisible Man directly from H.G. Wells. <laughs> That's, um, it's public domain now, isn't it, Invisible Man? It must yeah, be. It absolutely. must be. Uh, it is interesting to note that at that point, though, it seems that that's why they, of course, keep 
pumping the based on blah, 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 and kept promoting what? that this was as this movie I, states suggested by suggested by no they want to put that on there as a as if it's some sort of stamp of quality yeah but really all they've done is lease the idea of an invisible well, man and i feel like this is a precursor to so many things that are you know so and so's this movie you know i mean like like oh, sure. some, putting some name on a producer uh martin scorsese presents and he's an executive producer and it's always like yeah he didn't make this quentin yeah. tarantino presented a ton of movies you know yeah and you're like ah, quentin tarantino presents hostile i mean he's eli roth's friend like that's it yeah Bottom line it pays to be these guys buddies and yeah. then their name adds a little bit I of mean, clout how there. many how many robert zemeckis movies did steven spielberg present a lot yeah and um but as you yourself know from having rewatched all of them recently mm -hmm. generally speaking that was no shame on steven spielberg to no. put his name above that no because uh mostly zemeckis stuff great up to a uh, point uh, i completely agree all right let's not have this argument this is not <laughs> zemeckis zemeckis all right fair but enough what it's zemeckis <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> um uh the last little tidbit oh well no i should also say this movie cost uh, about three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, and its worldwide gross was about seven hundred and sixty thousand. So it made its money back; it doubled its money, but not not a big hit, not a big hit, because that's worldwide. And they're like, "Oh, that's all we're ever getting out of this." Okay, which is probably why they put the clamps on an invisible person until Bud and Lou came along. There's just not a lot to get excited about here. There is not. But here is a second opinion. That's right. I just had to pay some money to the <laughs> made people. I uh, yeah, I see. We just got an email from Paul Shear here. Um, oh, fast. <laughs> um, first off, hello, June. Yeah. <laughs> hello, June. Uh, all right. Um, the, uh, the dissenting not dissenting it's not that people think this movie shit even the people who wrote the book universal horrors that i've been reading they said hey it's an improvement over the last two it's just not as great as as the I'll, first i'll go with that this is not nearly as embarrassing as as invisible woman no this one tries to veer back into horror territory this one tries to veer back into oh this is a creepy concept instead of it's either a wacky comedic premise in Invisible Woman or kind of a espionage thriller thing. Not that this Agent, one which doesn't... I still like the concept of. Just I think work. Invisible Agent is the biggest missed opportunity. Although this one, I will say, and we'll get into it, uh, doesn't eschew wackiness. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and we'll talk about that. Anyway, um, so the last little tidbit, the dissenting view. Yes. John Carradine. <laughs> yes. John Carradine, a legend. Yes, uh, I love John Carradine. Mm -hmm. Who has said before, or did say before, that he took all these movies, all these genre pictures, these roles he took to finance him and his friends doing Shakespeare on stage. Well, that's great. <laughs> he did not care about these films. These were just fodder. It was a job. But he was asked in an, in an interview with uh, the film magazine, hammer horror oh, i'm sorry house of hammer mm -hmm. uh, they asked him if he actually liked any of the horror films he had ever been in and he thought about it and said invisible man's revenge this was the one okay uh, and, and i know that you okay john i know you it was not the vampire hookers it was <laughs> for yeah. him it was invisible man's revenge and uh he enjoyed it probably because he got to be a character and not really be the villain. He just got to be this adorable character off to the side. And he was buddies with John Hall. Okay. They, were, they were sailing buddies. They both took boats out. <laughs> not fight club uh, buddies. <laughs> no, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we so didn't, it's just, we didn't have a Cheney Crawford relationship. <laughs> no. Understand. I never went in a in a trailer trying to beat the snot out of John Hall. Um 
Oh man, John Carradine! Uh, I could never we've, do it. We've John seen Carradine. him. We've we've had li- little tastes of John Carradine in some of the previous movies. Because he's still he's still pretty young, uh, yeah. uh, uh, youngish. Yeah. Um, but just doing these little character parts. But this is the first time, really, in in the Universal Horror canon, and he's about to jump up in oh, yeah. profile quite a bit. Oh yeah. But at least here, this is just him saying, "Oh, I could do the the crazy doctor, sure." Um, and he does a fine job. This is just one of the 352 acting credits on his IMDb I was about page. To the reason this one rose to the surface of his mind when asked that question was just because he was having a fun time doing it. Oh, fair enough then. Buddy. You know, it's like, hey, on the weekend we'll go boating and then we'll come back and we'll do this dumb little movie. Yeah. <laughs> I can so, respect that. That is really all the factoids I have on this. And yeah, there's just really not a lot there. And even amongst fans of Universal Horror, this is fairly divisive. Uh, people give it weak praise because it is a slight course correction from what we had before. But um, but slight really sums up. Yeah, the Invisible Man's Revenge. That's exactly. I've, this movie isn't a giant piece of shit, but it's just not. There's nothing to get worked up about one way or the other. It's not horrible, oh. and it's not that good either. It's just kind of no. like. Eh, eh. And it's I short enough that it doesn't overstay its welcome by any means. I was surprised a little bit by John Hall, uh, as in pleasantly. This was, <laughs> I agree. Uh, you know, we only had him before Invisible Agent, and we did. That, we were not fans of him, Invisible Agent. No, terrible agent and terrible romantic lead, very yeah. creepy and and not good. Um, and his attempts at charming just didn't work. But here he's he's. He's psychotic. Yeah. Here he is a bad dude. Um, and he's pretty good and, at it. And he's enjoying it. I could tell. And the writers of that book believe that it may be because between Invisible Agent and this, he was doing all those Maria Montez, bright Technicolor, uh, sort of Arabian Nights themed yeah. kitty movies, like adventure movies for kids where it's bright and colorful and he dashes around with swords but very, you know, there's nothing there. Paper thin, being the heroic lead guy. Yeah. I am sent that or whatever. You're like, great. Uh, so for this, he was probably going, oh, I get to be totally irredeemable and uh, just a complete crazed killer. I'm on board for that. Yeah, Thank you. I, that, that was something that struck me because I'm used to, I mean, when I see John Hall's the star of this, I think, okay, here's another bland, you know, generically heroic lead. And or so, even worse pseudo charming yeah that they wanted him to do before and that really just didn't come off hall is really a pretty stock studio actor of the era yeah, he's fine guy. he's charming enough you know and this maybe because of the the way he's turning his character um i liked his voice i mean it, yeah he's got a good voice and it, i think it's actually used much better when it's saying things about I'll see you dead for this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, all right. I kept Good watching job. this going, I can't believe this is the same guy from Invisible Agent. That's right. So that is seems to be strange casting on the surface of it. Um, he's back. The last Invisible Man is now the new Invisible Man, not the same character, and a very different type of character, but the same actor. But nobody like, noticed or cared then. I have to say, no one noticed or cared. Yeah. I think you summed that up very well. All right, we should probably talk about the movie. I do want to talk about the poster first, though. Uh, oh God, John, you always do this. I do. I kind of, I try to roll forward <laughs> and you pull us back into the. Poster. I will never not talk about the post- poster, and <laughs> no, I will say please. on this, this poster is nothing. This poster is something I probably did in eighth grade, and I apologize. <laughs> it is the most like. Simple uh, outline of a man. Yep. Uh, outline of a man with his hands up like, ooh, I'm coming to get you. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, featureless, even as a silhouette, it's pretty featureless. Um, yeah. And then a bunch of heads around him. The only the only part of it I really like is that they use a crazed look of John Hall where he's got a guy up against a wall. Yeah. I do enjoy it's that. It's a weird thing where they're doing it's a, it's a kitchen sink thing where they've got kind of ish glamorous portraits of 
generic McFreddy um, and <laughs> Evelyn Anchors <laughs> up at the top corner. Yeah. Uh, like we're kind of concerned, but still very handsome. And then on the left hand side, you've got the ghoulishly creepy green colored portraits of side characters. They love green uh, for suspicious and nefarious horror, characters. Yeah. yeah. yeah horror is, uh, for some reason, green was always a big choice. Yeah. Um, but so, okay. These are the people being uh, affected by the invisible man yes. and the invisible man silhouettes in the middle. Mm -hmm. But then yes, strangely, they just throw in like a little action snippet, yeah. little, yeah. little, shot of as you say john hall throwing this dude up against a wall looking like a badass in this tiny little vignette and you're like yeah. why is that that these don't tie together nope uh visually Th this uh, poster screams like oh god we need a poster uh all right hang on i'll draw something up and you know it's not helped by just the title of the text itself is just sort of incredibly generic oh yeah just just stacked one on top of invisible man's revenge no boring typeface uh, look we, we've come to the point in the podcast where we're talking about fonts and getting angry <laughs> um uh speaking of fonts let's talk about mm -hmm. some taglines mm -hmm. um number one we have the one that's on the poster that we're looking at here which of course is all new all thrills now i I will give that this movie might have some thrills, Fairly but I would new. I would hardly call it all thrills. No. <laughs> Fairly new couple thrills. Yeah. Should be the true advertising. I there. don't think these thrills will fill the tills. I think that's the, that's that's no. going to be the problem for the theaters. <laughs> fill the tills with bills. No, it is not not going to do that. Uh let's talk about the this baffling a trail of terror. What? Well, um, the trail is very short since it all takes place in one little village. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. He's he doesn't. Th this might be the Invisible Man who leaves the 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 smallest trail of terror. This is such a small revenge. Yes. One of the problems with the scope of this is yes, we finally have the Invisible Man back as a a killer, yeah. as a as a as a villain. Yeah. Not even a tragic one. He's just a bad dude. Right. But yes, it's it's very small. It's focused on one family and really just like a couple people. Yeah, and that's that's the whole. This goal invisible is, man is not derailing trains. No, not he wants causing to any real havoc, and get his money. Yeah, and <laughs> the, he, the subtitle of this movie was "Bitch, better have my money." <laughs> uh, and then here, uh, of course, the final title, all caps. They're marked. Dot dot dot. For death. And they kind of are. Are they? Is that the goal here? Is 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 murder actually his plan in this movie? Um, Actually, I will say no. It does not start out that way. He, he's, he's not as bloodthirsty as I want him to be in this. They, they, they no. talk, he's a vicious killer, apparently. And then sort of out of necessity, he kills somebody. But he's not dropping bodies. Had he just gotten his money at the very beginning... None no of this would have happened. Die. Well, yeah. except for he probably would have still had to off the fiance because he's also gotten his head to get that girl. Well, that's that's that also he's, ne he's never met before. Yeah. See, this is all all right. We got to get into the movie now because I have we a lot. You have to get into it, John. We can't avoid it anymore. It is we the Invisible Man's revenge, and I have to say, a lot of my issues focus on said revenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and some confusion about the plot. Yeah. And also, I don't think this movie understands how blood works. No. <laughs> this, this, this movie, I'd say there are nine-year-olds living in the world today who understand much more about how blood works yeah. and how much a body can hold Yeah, and, of it and uh, what type yeah. should be going in. Uh, we'll get to the blood transfusion. Uh, opening titles, pretty lazy, just titles on top of smoke. Yeah. Not much to not much to say there. Vera West still on those gowns though. She is a monster for gowns. <laughs> Did Abbott and Costello ever meet Vera West? <laughs> you know what? That's something I've never paid attention to on the Abbott and Costello movies. I will be curious to see if she continues to design gowns for the she Abbott and Costello she, pictures. She goes, she goes in the office of the guys in charge of Universal and just goes, I cannot design gowns for Bud and Lou. I'm sorry. There's a limit to my abilities. 
I'm out. <laughs> Abbott and Costello will not meet Vera West. Uh, all right, so we open. Uh, we're on the the the, the boat docks, uh, yeah. and and we see this crate labeled London be uh, set down, and then a knife cut through the the canvas of it, and out comes John Hall. John Hall with a pencil thin mustache, looking a little, you know, uh, Errol Flynnish. Yeah. Uh, but he's a uh, he's he's already looking just desperate. Yep. And angry and just dangerous and he fits in on the docks because he's got that little dock workers cap on yep <laughs> which we find out he was working on yeah the dock. he actually was working on they issue Cape that Pals, cap south africa yeah they give you one of those yeah uh so we then cut to him he he, he scurries off of the the docks there into town and it cuts to him buying clothing at the store and like a guy's putting a coat on him the thing i love about this is and this is true of a lot of you know it's not just the universal horror films uh but i love in a movie where someone is a fugitive on the run Mm -hmm. and then they go out of their way to act like a fugitive on the run (laughs) there is not a moment of subtlety in him where he could have just played everything cool because the 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 tailor asked him a simple question about like uh so new in town or something he's like going he says did you did you cut (laughs) Did you come in on the boat? And he just grabs the guy and goes, what have you been spying on me? I don't want people spying on me. <laughs> I know. It's just like, okay. And he's like, wow, well, you would have not even stayed in this guy's memory three minutes after you left if you had just played things cool. The guy is just like, well, I just knew the boat was coming in. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, dude. You, uh, yeah. And then I, I, I like if he's like, oh, I'm, <clears throat> Sorry, I uh, went off the handle there. And he's like, oh, it's all right. I almost want him to go, it happens all the time in here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I'm right close to the dock. So, you know, I get a lot of people coming there going, are you spying on me? I get shaken about from time to time. That's about three times a week. (laughs) By the Um, way, holy shit, the amount of British accents in this movie. We talk about wacky British people in these movies. This is the ultimate movie for it. This one's got almost wall to wall uh except for john hall <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true who uh, says he does say like uh well i just it's i haven't been here in a long time uh, he goes i've been away for a long time he's like where you been i'm like taylor learn your lesson you know it's like don't ask another question that's like oh where have you been i thought when he said that i thought he was gonna grab me again and go why are you spying on me <laughs> yeah, again <laughs> uh yeah instead he just goes i've just been lost for a long time yeah. and walks out with his new clothes oh first a cop a bobby peek, yeah looks keep peeks in a window and he hides from that once again this yeah. is where i was thinking boy this guy's really letting on what a criminal he is oh, doesn't so... like casually go oh do you have a restroom or can i go to a dressing room or anything like that or just turn his back yeah he could just no. turn his back he to like the presses himself up against a wall it's like <sighs> he does that cool maneuver of spinning the 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 tall mirror that yeah. you check yourself out in he spins that towards the window and kind of hides behind it I'm like but it, but yeah. i also like bugs his eyes out and is like looking around like, i know oh, no, i know no, it's no. like dude play it well motherfucking cool as will come to because he he leaves and he and the, the guy says what well, do you want your your old clothes he's like no just keep them and i like the guy's like hey thanks like great like, wow i'm a tailor who's just been given a shitty bunch of clothes that's awesome that this day could not be going better but i laughed so hard at this when the guy reaches into the pocket of the coat and out comes a newspaper headline with a picture of john hall that says homicidal maniac uh escapes institute kills two interns and i'm just like he like what this is for his scrapbook Uh (laughs) uh-huh he escaped down the elevator shaft well you know if you are a crazed uh homicidal maniac yeah homicidal maniac one of the first things you do is start a scrapbook (laughs) and uh god bless him he won he kept his clippings with him well he finally made the news (laughs) Uh, just so stupid so stupid so we also know that his name is rob griffin from this and and robert griffin why is he griffin why he's only griffin because of the two people in the theater go griffin that name is often associated with invisible mans but shouldn't john carradine be griffin (laughs) yeah he should yeah it should always be the scientist this guy has no 
that's not part of his makeup at all. No. Um, so he's not the creator of this serum. Uh, he is a crazed lunatic and guy this, who this just movie, happens to have the last name of Griffin. This movie in no way alludes to the fact that the serum has existed prior to John Carradine's discovery of it or that there's any kind of thing like that. The, it, it, no, this doesn't tie in at all with previous but, stories. Which is fine, except for it becomes incredibly confusing when you call the guy Griffin. Yeah. It's almost just like a shout out to fans. It's all it is. Yeah. But it did mislead me, at least in the beginning, for a while, thinking, oh, will he talk about a serum he's been working on? And no. I also it had took the thought. It a while for him to get to the point of invisibility serum, period. Oh, I wrote uh, that. I have, a, I have a time on when he turns invisible. And, when, <laughs> and when, once we get there, we're like, oh, oh, this guy has nothing to do with other than blind luck. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. This guy lucks into a few things in this movie. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it cuts from the... N n another thing I'm thinking, because it's John Hall, because of the previous Invisible Man movies that we've just watched recently, I'm thinking, oh, he must be falsely accused of being a homicidal maniac. Yeah, that that is not the case. Which I'm glad that... I'm actually glad I was wrong about that. Uh, there is an interesting possibility regarding his sanity that we'll get to in a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Well, because we cut from here to what I wrote down as a gathering of rich people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And we have Evelyn Anchors here, who is the daughter of these people. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. She's the daughter of uh, of of uh, the Herricks. Uh, Irene the Herrick. and Sir Jasper Herrick. Sir Jasper. These guys look, okay, maybe they're late 40s, early 50s. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to imply maybe that... Uh, their daughter, played by Evelyn Anchors, what's her name again? Her name is Julie. Yeah. Julie. Um, you know, what is she supposed to be, like, 20 or something? She must be. Like, as far as what her character age is, but I'm looking at her going, oh, there's not a huge gap between Jasper and his wife and their daughter. Uh, Evelyn Anchors would have been 26 daughter. at this point. Yeah. All right, so maybe it's not that far off as far as the possibilities, but yeah, she's just not like she could be the daughter. No, I, I, that's why I kept going. Is she? Is she their niece? That's why mm -hmm. I said like it's you no, know, it's it's the daughter, and she's introducing her boyfriend to them or fiance. I didn't fully get a. This is Mark though, played by Alan Curtis, who I have to say also has a pencil thin mustache and is yep. almost identical to John Hall. Yeah, this was a, a bad choice just on a visual because for half a second say, I thought, have we skipped time and he's now found a girl and this is <laughs> it, it's a little bit confusing. And I did not assume an identity person, but at the same time I was like, oh no, that's not a not a good choice, people. No. And what's great about his character is they're having the first like getting to know the family dinner. Yeah. Uh and he's Likeable and charming and bland. And I'm like, Always wow. Bland. Yeah. He's sort of uber Freddy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not really a Freddy because he's not a romantic rival. He's the guy who, is, and, and Julie has no interest in, in Griffin ever. Julie doesn't even Griffin. know who Griffin is. No, which doesn't make a lot of sense when we learn, when we learn about the backstory of Griffin and, and Sir the, Jasper. Yeah, the Herricks. Uh, the Herricks. You're like how if he was such a good friend that they're going on like some African safari thing together, why has their daughter never heard of this dude? She vaguely is familiar with the name. She's like, Oh, I think my parents once knew someone named Griffin years ago. Right. Like But they make it seem like he is uh, almost like a member of the family to a certain extent. He's right. their closest plus, friend. That safari was only five years ago. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You find out that was only five years ago. It's, it's not like when Julie was four they went on this. No. no like, I'm vaguely aware that there was some guy. You know what? Everything's a blur for me. <laughs> well, half she just got out of rehab. Yeah. I have the time being romanced by a wolf man. And also, you know, I've got these ties to the Frankensteins. It's been a tough few years. Look, Evelyn Anchors is just thrilled not to be around Lon Chaney Jr. Let's be honest. That's what's going on here. I love the idea that he would, whatever movie he's working on that point, Cobra Woman or whatever. He, I love the idea of just going over to the other set going, hey, Evelyn. Hey. Hey, wait. What are you doing? He's like hanging out in her, in you, her dressing uh, room. Waiting on it like going, 
how was today huh good <laughs> i just thought i'd stay in here because uh, i had chili for lunch and i didn't want to call these nasty farts in my my uh trailer so i used yours as a as a gas room if that's okay <laughs> a little hot house surprise for you that officially might be the meanest joke we've done about lunch <laughs> are you using Apple anchors a trailer for for a fart room just the, <laughs> just just the casual asshole nature of that is what i like about it well you know they were close yeah. they really got caught. she's the only uh, one i never complained about my smell <laughs> at least not to my face um <laughs> uh, even jack pierce kept his mouth shut <laughs> So he's afraid I do something to his hands, his precious <laughs> hands. Uh, anyway, so, so yeah, yeah, they they uh, we we find out that uh, uh, Mark is a, a newspaper man, uh, yep. and uh, he's always looking for a hot scoop, which will be important later. And uh, it's that that they they keep trying to suggest because this is taking place in small English town. Yes, which at least has this one wealthy family that has its own estate but very it's very wealthy from the look of it yeah small english english town and yet they're presenting this guy as if he's sort of like big city newspaper man always looking for a, like what are the scoops like a two-headed <laughs> cow that born down the well, road based on how how quickly he jumps on an invisible man there he's he's writing for some rag right yeah well it, or he's just desperate he's like yeah. anything please god anything other than <laughs> He's like you know, an intern at the paper, right? Or, and he's he's trying he's pumping himself up, and he's looking for the big right. scoop that'll make him. This is the one. Yeah, just make my name. All right, Marky, this is the one. This is gonna be it. All right, Invisible Man. <laughs> Otherwise, what kind of life is he gonna provide for our lovely? Well, they uh, say that when he leaves, they're like, "Well, he's a nice young boy, though he doesn't have much family or any money that can be spoken of." I thought. Okay, uh, one of the grossest but very appropriate telling lines is I going, well, he's nice enough. I mean, she could have had much worse. And it's like, uh, comes from good blood. Yes. They actually use that phrase. And I'm like, well, that is very classist and uh, and so it's just a gross idea. But then I did think later in the movie, oh, that was a clever choice because his blood oh right and blood becomes an actual thing later in the movie and i was like oh i think that was a writer's choice and at that point it didn't rub me as wrong i was like that was clever i didn't think about I that that actually writer too much credit yeah welcome to brendan's <laughs> giving the writer too much credit corner yeah that's the end of the credit for the writer on this one, though. I will. <laughs> That's the last clever thing done in this movie. Uh, I will say this movie. Once we get to the actual backstory, which we will very soon. Yeah. Um, it it seemed like a half baked episode of Alfred Hitchcock presents with an invisible thing thrown into it. That or yeah, or like um, the radio show suspense. This is like because the whole like. We thought you were dead. We we never would have just left you behind in the Congo or whatever. And uh, now, well, now I'm back for my money. All that's is like, you better give it to me. Oh, we better get rid of this guy. So all that is very much sort of like domestic thriller mystery stuff right there. I, I had that same thought. Uh, early on, I'm watching it going, I, I'd be interested in this movie if there wasn't an invisible person in it. I, I'd actually prefer it's that. Better yeah, yeah. It, it, if it was actually better <laughs> yeah because i'm just like okay this is just kind of a revenge movie uh right. sure and we're gonna okay. there's some uh ambiguity about the herricks that yeah. oh they... yeah i have no they idea they don't address it so they leave it as inference and that's a shame because that actually adds <laughs> this movie needs some subtlety and and craft and so you said they're going Oh, are they going to spin this in an interesting direction? No, they're just teasing you with possibly spinning this in an interesting direction. Well, because once again, I'm still watching this. Look, so what happens is uh, uh, Griffin comes in here, uh, Rob. Uh, Julie has left, so she still yeah. doesn't see. Right. And so then after she leaves and they have this little conversation about Mark, then the butler, uh, Cleghorn, is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, before we get to that, can I just bring up, because that reminded me, I, it was so strange, the choice here, because 
All right, Griffin. Griffin is a, a fugitive on the run, but only people in Cape Town, South South Africa, know right. that he's a fugitive on the run. Right. He's in a small English village where maybe some people might know him, I guess, because he knows the Herricks or whatever. Yeah. But for some reason, he's come to their house, but Julie drives off with her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Griffin's like hiding in the bushes wearing like his hat and his co- coat. Oh yeah. We until they drive off and then he goes to the house. I'm like, "What are you hiding well, from?" And they no, drive no. off as what? they drive off, he, they drive past him. He's like, "Oh, Julie." Yeah, he actually does like, "Julie." Yeah. To which once my first thought is, "Oh, were they involved at one time?" Yeah, that would have be a, a fair guess. No, instead it I actually like that it's creepier than that. But once it, I don't like a lot of things in a lot of these movies, that's a cool idea that they don't really do much with. <laughs> do anything with. So, yeah, sorry. Then he shows up, and um, Cleghorn comes in and goes, uh, un- uh, unannounced visitor at the door uh, says he's a friend of yours named Rob Griffin. And they're like, what the fuck? G- get him in here. Rob Griffin. And immediately they're like, good Lord, Rob. It's so amazing to see you. I can't believe it. Uh, they're all happy. Him. they thought he was dead there he is it's been five years mm-hmm. sit down tell us what you've been up to yeah now we really thought you were dead <laughs> it's it's so they ask him what he's been up to for five years and he says i don't remember yeah the whole story here is we we get this i'll just lay it out yeah go for it because i'm on a roll <laughs> i don't know john <laughs> I got this going. I'm feeling it. I I'm in tell. the Griffin story. <laughs> uh, anyway, the three of them, uh, Jasper, is it Irene? Yeah. His wife? Yeah. Uh, and Rob Griffin, they were on safari or some sort of expedition in Africa yeah. five years ago. Yeah. Um, and th- they get, I don't know, what was the threat? I don't remember. Something. Yeah. They they have to run for their lives for some reason. Yeah. And in the course of that, poor old Rob gets clonked on the fucking head. Yep. So bad that they're pretty sure he's just dead. Yeah. And so they leave one of their guides with him, and then they they just get out. Well, and he says but it they, in this way, though, that he's like, and then something hit me in the head, to which I'm like, oh, shit, they tried to murder this guy. Maybe, yeah. Uh, that's one of the implications. No follow-up. So, <laughs> no, just again, implication. Yeah. But yeah, so they escape. The one thing, though, is that this all happened after they had already found a diamond mine. Yes. So they have found this this thing. I guess maybe they were looking for. A million dollars in be, diamonds, he says. They're going to be very, very wealthy if they get out. So they did survive, left the guy behind, uh, the guide with their dead buddy, Rob Griffin. Only problem is Rob was not dead. And so that's why they ask him, like, what have you been up to for five years? And we're, we're sorry. We never would have left you if we thought you were still alive, but we were pretty sure you were dead. Uh, and he's like, yeah, sure. So all he remembers is getting conked on the head and then waking up just like months ago. Yeah. So a whole five years is gone. And, uh, and he's like, whatever happened with that diamond mine? Because we all agreed we'd split it evenly, and I want my share of it. That's why I'm here. Yeah. He's here for his money. I want my money. Pretty and much. Once, and once he again, I, I'm watching strong. this now going, I, at this point I'm thinking, okay, the Herricks are the villains here. That's what's going to happen. Because it seems like, once again, the way John Hall's playing is like, something hit me in the head. And I'm like, oh, and they took the money. There's that implication, and I... There's also the implication that maybe that was innocent, but at this point they're not. They will become villainous at this point because they don't want to give up well, whatever they do still have of the money. So at this point, it does become more like let's off this guy. They may not have been responsible for the injury, but also the implication is maybe Rob Griffin wasn't so fucked up until he got hit in the head. Well, because so- when he wakes up. He ends up in an asylum in Cape Town, South Africa. Which we never and get explained as to how that happens or why that happened. No, and he didn't know who he was. He became a dock worker in South Africa because he had no idea who he was and then ends up in the asylum and then, I guess, wakes up and remembers who he is. Well, he says he got hit in the head 
by a crane on the dock and it all came oh. back to him. Because it is that movie amnesia thing where you get hit in the head and you lose your memory, then you get hit in your head yep. again and you gain it back. Right. Okay, exactly. Uh, but by this point, he's homicidal. I, yeah. Maybe Rob Griffin was not that bad off before all these fucking <laughs> hits in the head. Um, Traumatic but brain he's trauma. Yeah, there, yeah. Clearly psychotic now, wants his money, and as uh, Lord Jasper explains, hey, buddy, we bad investments. That million in diamonds didn't last like you think it did. So all we have now is we've got a comfortable living and we've got this estate. And he's like, great, I'll take yeah, he, my share. He inherited the state, uh, the estate, oh, is what he right. says, because it's a family thing. I I didn't buy this place, Griffin. <laughs> like, he's like, well, great, just I don't care. Just give me my cut. And they're like, yeah. you mean half of what we have? He's like, well, I want my half of the million. So that might even be everything you've got. Yeah. And I'll wait right here while you give it to me. Yeah. And at this point, Irene's like, you know what? This is a lot to take in. We should all have a drink. Yeah. And this is where it's very Alfred Hitchcock presents. She's like, what do you want? He's like, whiskey. She's like, all right. Yeah. He well, goes I, over. She makes the drinks. Yeah. He, t- he t- slips something and robs. Yeah. And so then I'm once again going, I 100% see what's going on here. They're murderous people. They tried to kill him for the money. Now he's back. They're going to try to kill him again. That's going to start the revenge. And once again, I'm thinking the Invisible Man is going to be the hero of the movie. And that's kind I of a problem. Was, that's kind of my problem attitude, with the movie. Well, that's true. Uh, his attitude never comes across heroic, injured, sure, but or at also least an anti-hero. I mean, you know, it seemed like it, it seemed to me like he was going to be. Why make them nefarious at all if you're not gonna if you're gonna make him a pure villain? Is I guess what my point. Um, what I discovered in my readings mm. is there were there was cut material. We're about to get to one of the confusing story points very quickly here, as in immediately. Um, and there was a much clearer indication of what they exactly have done to Rob now, not in the past, though apparently well, there was a prequel seen in the original script that showed them in africa so that would have helped too that would have helped maybe we didn't get that but they actually did shoot the scene well let's first talk about how this wraps up <laughs> well she so gives he, he oh yeah go. well the, the they're drinking and he's sort of uh getting more and more messed up and weird until yeah. eventually he passes out and i like irene i think i wrote this down she says like uh look this man is definitely psychopathic he just passed out after one drink which holy shit that's all it takes to be a psychopath well she has clearly drugged him yes no exactly i even wrote he's been drugged but i like that she's playing that but i'm saying in in anyone's mind that would be like well look clearly he's a psychopath i gave him one drink and he passed out oh we should also mention that while he while rob was giving the well this is what happened that i recall on our little trip and all this and by the way I have our agreement. Yes. That, oh, uh, that's key here. Yeah. That we would let everything. I have it right here. I have it right here. Remember Russ writing this? And like, yeah, we totally remember that. Anyway, um, and he looks at a portrait of oh. Julie on the wall. He goes, that's gets... Julie, huh? And they're like, yeah, um, of course. But how he goes, well, I remember that that photo you guys had in Africa of her. And they're like, oh, that's right. We had a photo of her. And he goes, you know what happened to that photo? And they're like, no. And he goes, I had it. I kept it. So we also mm-hmm. find out that Rob has been full on creeping yeah. on their, at that point, I guess fairly grown, but not fully grown, probably teenage daughter. And he kept their her photo, yeah. even though he's never met her, strangely, even though they're all close friends, and has been fixated on her for a while. I have to so say- that's just. As soon as he said, did you ever wonder what happened to that photo you had of her? I'm like, I don't want to know what happened to that photo. I don't want to know. (laughs) Uh, Let's just say that I had it laminated and leave it at that. (laughs) That photo Um, saw things, man. That photo saw things. (laughs) If that photo could talk, it wouldn't because it would have been shocked mute (laughs) in the silence. (laughs) Um, Anyway, sorry, listener. I I could I don't know I think the movie implies that I don't think that's on me I think that's on the movie. Nineteen forty four film had that in its mind. That's you projecting, my friend. I don't know. And then the way um, he's just like Julie, 
I just yeah, I wrote clear. I actually wrote down he's lusting after a portrait. Lusting after a portrait and apparently a photo that yeah. he's kept for years of a woman he's never met. A long since disintegrated photo. Um Ooh, But um so um this is all before he passes out. But yeah. they have drugged his drink, he passes out, yeah, and then we have very strange little scene of you hear Rob Griffin. Yeah. Uh, saying things like, and uh, don't think that'll stop me because I'll be... And Cleghorn looking over the banister yeah. at uh, Lord... What's his name? It's Jasper. Julius? Sir Jasper. Jasper. Yeah, and he basically <laughs> just throws him out of the house. But it's not him. He's got uh, Rob Griffin in the coat and hat, yeah. and he's walking him out, and we hear Rob Griffin saying things, and then Jasper throws him out the front door, closes the front door, and yeah. says, if you see that guy around here, don't let him in, because yeah. he's bad news. This is one of the and... things that confused me, because then it cuts to Rob Griffin waking up on like the banks of a river. Yeah. So here's the thing. What got cut was apparently, and there was in the press book, a shot of the Herricks on the riverbank with Rob Griffin at their feet. So okay. what we actually saw there was um, Irene in the coat and hat. And Jasper is doing the voice a dead of on impression. Griffin. Yeah, I know. A dead-on impression because it's just John Hall yeah. being 80 yard in. Yeah. So um, that was just for the, just for the because the guy's passed out. He wouldn't be able to walk even right. with the guy holding him up. Right. So Irene goes out the door, then circles back around. Then I mean, this is Alfred Hitchcock presents. Yeah. They pull out the unconscious Griffin. Now the the now the um, butler's been shown what they needed to right, see. Right. They drag his unconscious self out to the river and they dump him in. Or, or, or like their intention is to drown the dude. I you, there's no way to pick that up from the information that's actually in the movie. No way to pick that up. I mean, what the movie the apparently the the decision was even though it's an interest one of the only interesting things they could do with the plot, the theater was like, well, they're now they are now unsympathetic right. so you've got a, a villain after them uh they wanted julie's julie to be an innocent and how could she be an innocent if she had these monsters for parents so they just like well, if we cut that it does look like he threatened them and they kicked his drunk ass out of the house and then he ends up at the riverbank and throws himself in and then goes hell i actually thought hell. for a second i thought jesus did jasper throw him like miles <laughs> yeah i know, I know. Uh, well i do think that this river goes through their property so it i don't think that's as far away as it seems but yes um i, I thought it was hilarious because we do cut to the little bridge over this river oh boy and we have here he comes. I was hoping I was hoping he would be like uh, just in and out, like just a quick little. Oh no, no, we've no. Got, uh, his name is is it Henry Higgins or is it it's something like Henry Higgins? It is Herbert Higgins. Herbert Higgins, right? Okay, so that's the character name of a local rustic. Yeah, he's kind of a drunk. He's apparently a a. a uh, a cobbler. I call him. I just wrote. I was just referring to him as drunk in my notes for like two and a half pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> drunk guy, very cockney and very blustery. Look, if you wanted, and they think he's comedy gold. If you wanted that caretaker from Dracula to be a main character, this is about yeah. as close as you're gonna get. Yeah, this is uh Martin's yeah. uncle. He's older and balder. What, what, what is going on here? Yes. He is drunk. He's on the bridge, yeah. and he hears, help. Yeah. This did crack me up. I keep doing that. I mean, I think John Hall did yeah. a very decent job in this movie help. to some degree. Help me. But the, the helps yeah. are so help. lame. I'm it's drowning. Like, help. <laughs> help me. Help. But drunk guy first looks at his bottle because yeah. that's what you do. He's like, it's a Whoa. classic drink. 
What? What am I drinking? <laughs> Apparently, I've, I'm so drunk. I'm imagining someone crying for help. Yep. But yes, he saves Rob Griffin from drowning. Um, takes him back to his little cottage, and it's amazing how quick that they're buddies now. Oh well, I just love he pulls him out of the water, and then it just cuts to Griffin like in a bed, and he's got a cup of coffee. And he's like, "Well, thanks, pal, for saving me." Yeah, <laughs> and he's apparently told him the whole story. Yeah, like the whole story. So that's how it is. Because yeah, because you got you got Herbert Higgins and they go. So, they still owe you a million dollars in diamonds. What? You know, he's like, that's right. And they have to pay me because I have that agreement right here in my wallet. What? Why it's gone. Hey, yeah. Why it's gone. So, yes, the Herricks also rifled through his wallet to get that before they threw him in the river. Yeah. Um, this is just and so- I, love that, I love that Herbert's like, what you need is a lawyer. I know a fella. This guy knows a lawyer? <laughs> well, I guess maybe he's been into the, in and out of the drunk tank so much. Yeah, well, the implication here is when they when he does you know, hook him up with his legal representative buddy, it's clearly like the Saul Goodman of this little sure. British town. He's not the top guy because the chief inspector dude shows up at the Herricks and uh, very quickly just goes, you got no case. Get the fuck out of well, here. That's blackmail. I love that Herbert is with the lawyer to ask about this money. Do just send yeah. the lawyer? He's like, you owe him some money. Yeah, which okay, immediately this, ruins your plan, case. This plan of Rob Griffin, his big revenge, has been <laughs> first threatening, yeah, uh, and then handing over the fate of his case. To this drunk cobbler hey. and his his shyster buddy, who's very timid, and just goes, "Oh well, I didn't have all the 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 knowledge of the case. Uh, you know, now that I hear it spoken out loud, this seems like a waste of your time, Sir Jaster. I'm, I'm I w- very sorry. I wash my hands of it, and then he leaves. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I do like the idea of uh, Griffin just being like, "Yeah, sure, Herbert, take a run at it." <laughs> yeah, you know what? My whole plan of hiding in the bushes, then going in and accusing them and uh, and threatening them didn't quite work. So whatever you got on tap, can't can't oh. can't do any worse, Herbert. Apparently, you can. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yes. Yeah. Uh, so we get we Herbert, get that scene. Higgins, the lawyer, uh, they go to present Rob's case to Lord Jasper, who has his own friend come over, and that's the chief inspector of the town. Yeah. He sits there going, this sounds a lot like blackmail, and you got no proof, so get the fuck out of here. Uh, although Jasper does lie and say that Rob was just some drifter who wandered in the other night demanding money. So once well, again... I, it, it, the, Harris, I, the Harris are covering. Yeah, yeah they well, are, I mean, they that's, are. that's the thing where it's like they can cut it down as much as they want, but I still kept thinking throughout the whole movie. But the Herricks aren't likable or good people. No, they're not. So Julie is the, yeah. and her boyfriend, her fiance, are the only innocents in the movie, yeah. but they have been so briefly handled early and then disappear for so long. They're not the crux of this movie. They're not. You're we not sitting there still going, have yet to meet the film's true hero, in my opinion. That's. I know exactly <laughs> who you're talking about. Would it be Gray Shadow? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would be Gray Shadow. Who is, absolutely. by is every so definition, the hero of this movie? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's so strange. That's what that's what hinges on the. Oh, okay. We'll get there. All right. Yeah. So this plan did not work. No. For some reason, now Rob is just wandering around outside in the rain. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're sad. That's what you do. Uh, so he's wandering outside in the rain. He is looking at a street sign and appears to be lost. Goes to knock on a on a door. Who should open the door but John Carradine or was yeah. it Doctor Dreyer? Doctor Dreyer, I believe. Yeah, a Drury, Doctor Drury, Drury. And uh, he's, you know, even I'd say he's probably in his early thirties here. Um, he always looked skeletal and yeah. old. I was gonna say he's probably in his early thirties, but he looks sixty easily. Uh. His frame and features are, I mean, it's, I'm glad he ended up on the stage and in film just because, and his sons ended up being lean, handsome guys, yeah. but he is just this, 
he's a cadaver from the yes. get go. Yes. Just yes. the way that face is stretched out. But here he is in um non villainous, actually quite eccentric and oh. kind of adorable. Although scientist. immediately upon his introduction, I'm like, uh oh, it's John Carradine. <laughs> Of course, because be you're trained. Yeah, you're trained to see that. Yeah, but he's like, "Hey, what are you doing out here?" Oh, sure, come on in. <laughs> you know, here's here's my dog, and here's my parrot. Oh yeah, and here he looks at a he open he looks at a cage with something running around in there, but you can't see it. And there's a parrot <laughs> making noise, but you can't see it. And then finally, the dog comes in, and it's a harness, but there's nothing in it. Well, can't it you crack me up? It's like those things you would get at the the county fair, the yep. invisible dog yep. on a leash thing, where yes, there is a obviously wire suspended harness walking around that is the dog, mm-hmm. and the the bird in the cage, the pair in the cage, is just the the little swing, and the cage is going back and forth, but there's no bird on it. I'm like, wow, this is the cheapest invisible effects they've done yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but of course, uh, Rob is like. I'm losing my mind. This is crazy. You keep talking about these. He's like, no, I assure you, Brutus is there. Go ahead and pet him. <laughs> and uh, by God, he does. Yeah. Uh, and he said, but, but, but there's no dog. I can't see it, but I can feel a dog. And he's like, yeah, well, I've figured out invisibility in this little English village. Me, this nobody. I'm a genius. Yep. And, and I wrote, I've I wrote, never tried it on people. I uh, I love this line from John Carradine. In this house, you've got to believe what you can't see. Oh, <laughs> here's the problem is I know that uh, the screenwriter, when he wrote that, he had to sit back and just go, yes. <laughs> well, I he earned so my pay for today. <laughs> I think he probably did take an early lunch. That was Bertram <laughs> Milhauser, yep. the screenwriter of this. And I'm sure he sat there and was like going, boom, they will be talking about this. <laughs> In decades to come, I think cut I to take 2020, that. and that actually did. Yeah, I guess I guess the joke's on us. Uh, you have to believe what you can't see. Yeah. Huh? We asked Bertram, huh? and he says, "Hey, you're still talking about it." <laughs> yeah. Laugh all you want, Corona boys. I've been dead for years, and you're still talking about my genius work. <laughs> By the way, are we now the Corona Boys? Will that be our next <laughs> Gosh, podcast? We're the, we're the Corona Boys. Uh, like the Sunshine Boys, only not as funny. Uh, you know, what well, depends on which uh, which version of the Sunshine Boys you're talking about. Oh, well, you know, I wish I could have seen the original stage show. Mm-hmm. But I'll take a, a Walter Matthau, George Burns. Uh, what what was the Woody Allen did one, too. Did you, did you ever see that one? It was like a TV uh, I didn't. It, it just. I. Eh. It's not. It's not good. Is is what. What's weird is Woody Allen. Well, there are plenty of problems, but Woody Allen and other people's things. Sometimes it's like, you know, scenes from a marriage in Beverly Hills. Is that what it was called? Um, oh, uh, yeah. That he did for. Uh, was it Mazursky? No. Uh, scenes from a it? mall. Scenes from a mall. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, with him and Bette Midler. Yes. He was pretty good in that. Yeah. And I think he did a really good job in Ants. Yes. As a, uh, as a as a as a Woody Allen ant, yes, but uh, yeah, I I don't want to see him. It's him and Peter Falk. Time. That's that's who him it is. Him and Peter Falk, yeah. and again, two people I like. Or yeah, I should always put an asterisk, like as in a performer. <laughs> I uh, when it comes to Woody Allen, I can only say I'll watch the movies and just pretend that someone else made them. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome to the uncomfortable part of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this, we switched into the Corona Boys. Uh, that this is now <laughs> an episode of the Corona Boys found its way into here, where it's it's a, it's a little bit sadder show. Mm-hmm. Let's jump back into uh, Campbell and Jones meet the monsters. <laughs> uh, so he said, "Yes, he's been testing his formula on animals, but never a human." And he says something about, uh, "You know, when I rescued this dog, he was a victim of other dogs and." Uh, you know, the, the, especially a dog would, would pair up and a couple and attack him. Do you understand that? He's like, yes, I do understand what that's like. This dog has the exact same backstory as me. <laughs> Even though I guess maybe that's not true. Um, I mean, I was a dock worker for a long time. Did the dog ever work on the docks? <laughs> Tell me he did. did. An asylum. And there is one line here that is important about when the dog barks at 
uh, Griffin the first time. He says, oh, yes, he's very protective of me. If anyone were to even raise a hand to me, he'd kill them. I did not yeah. think this would become Chekhov's dog, but... Uh, Chekhov's pooch, yeah. <laughs> introduced here, pays I mean, off in the third act. Gray Shadow, hero of the movie. And I will say, a good animal actor. Like, yeah. Just, not I his own, that dog. Not his only appearance. I looked up his IMDb. Uh, he also appeared in uh, Wolf Call, Marked Man, Sign of yeah. the Wolf, Wild yeah. Geese Calling, My Pal Wolf, and okay. It Shouldn't Happen to a Dog. I think I think he became the titular wolf for a series of films. It seems like that, yes. Um, he's he's a, a very nice German shepherdy looking dog. Um, I wonder if he and and uh, Moose, uh, Lon Chaney's pal, hung out together on the lot. I would hope so. I, I hope like, they had some doggy fun times. I like to think so too. He did uh, work again with Leon Errol, who plays uh, Herbert in this movie, in said it shouldn't happen to a dog. Nice. Yeah. They re <laughs> yeah. Not much of a team. They don't spend a lot of screen time together. In fact, I don't think they spend any screen time together in this movie. No, I don't. Bo- no, that's not true. They definitely do because Herbert will try to kill the dog in this movie. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, they have a whole a whole sequence together. They have a whole set piece. <laughs> <laughs> uh all right so let's see the yeah the uh oh we get the dog eating a piece of meat which they are very happy to show you invisible things mm-hmm. um so i do this you want to talk about another brilliant line from the screenplay this is another I do. Uh, john carradine line if a man were invisible he'd be hard to find Look, John Carradine was a great actor, but good luck ever selling that line as anything. Uh, this is so... That and and again, we, we cut back to Bertram, and he's like going, "All right, they can't all be gold." I do like these I'll Family Guy style work. cutbacks to him and his typewriters looking at the camera, going like, "Hey, they can't all be winners." I'll put in some extra work this weekend, okay, to make up for that one. <laughs> I know I t- I got a little cocky. When I did the thing about here in this place, you have to believe what you can't see. It's hard to find a man who's invisible because you can't see him. No, oh, there's got to be a better way to phrase it. Let's see. How do I do this? He's just crumpling up pages that's, and tossing them. That's not uh, it. That's not it. Man wastes paper like nobody's business. He's just putting one line on each page. Uh, but I will say, of all the cottages Rob Griffin could have knocked on. I know. This, this was the one. What luck, because pretty quickly he's on a table getting injected with this stuff. <laughs> he's like, dude, you got your first human test subject right here. And so I looked at this. This is a 77-minute movie, and at minute 29, this guy turns invisible. Mm-hmm. That's that's a while for, what, the fifth invisible movie that we've watched? Yeah. Get get to the invisibility. A little. I mean, hell, the first Invisible Man movie just opened up and he was invisible. Well, again, the the formula has been broken yeah. a couple of times now of usually, you know, we don't see the actor till the very end when they die and they, they fade back into the sight. Right. But we, we've, we haven't had that now in, in a while. We haven't. Um, yeah, this is, the effects are okay. It's like we've been down this road before. We have, it, it, they feel a little weaker here to me than they have in previous ones. They're like two kind of cool things dealing with an in-between stage of visibility and invisibility that were actually pretty impressive Mm -hmm. and uh it's not like i don't think they were phoning this in it's just that they said they're going right here's the transformation scene we know how to do that we'll do this okay no big deal here's the walking around and look i'm in a suit of clothes thing we've done that a million times well, I think but honestly, there are a couple of things later on. I was like, "Oh, nice." I was thinking about that watching this. I think one of the reasons they made so many of these not I mean they were successful, but it was just like they, they we've already it out. Yeah, we've already cracked it, so we just rinse and repeat. We've got the effects down, which is actually one of the things that a lot of the reviewers harped on. They're like, "Dude, this is tired." Yeah. A lot of the reviews from the period were like this adds nothing to it. We've seen all this stuff before. Right. Fair enough. Which I guess is you know, if you had a stronger story, 
uh, and better directing, better acting, uh, then the same old tired effects would be just fine. They just didn't want to stretch. They just never wanted to stretch with these. They're like, we know how to do it. Here's your invisible nonsense. <laughs> and here's just a dumb little story to attach it to. Mm-hmm. We do get a little bit of John Carradine going a tiny bit insane, a little bit Frankenstein-like here for like a no, split it's second. It's not insane. It's, it's ego. Yeah. At this point, he's like going, my name will be uttered with along with the greats. You know, and he lists off Look at what I've language. done. But he's like, look, look at this, my achievements, you know. But he's not quite losing it. But it's like no scientist in the universal movie can complete an experiment without a little bit going like, I am God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he also, uh, Drury here says, um, uh, because I think Griffin asks, he's like, well, well, how long till I turn back? He goes, oh, you won't. Not until you die. He goes, if we do this, that's it. Which we also find out later was Jury just talking out his ass. <laughs> yes. Oh, for the love of God. Hmm. Yeah. This the basically from here on the movie is completely off the rails. Uh, Do you mean it gets awesome? <laughs> because you're right. From this point on, once Griffin's finally invisible, it becomes awesome. So I like that Drury's like, well, I need to run some more tests, and you and I will show off this experiment and. Pretty immediately, Griffin's like in his coat and hat, going like, "No thanks, Doc. I gotta go." It, it literally, it literally is like he's like going, "Nope, <laughs> got places to be, Doc." And he walks out the door, and it just leaves Drury like in the door frame, like, "Go." Oh. oh, I would go after you, but I'd never find you, because as previously he, stated, he, Invisible Man is hard to find. So you are in a cat coat and hat. This is the first invisible movie, uh, invisible person movie, where not once does anyone really call attention to he's got to be freezing, yeah, and and he's got to be naked. Like uh, even though that's obviously the case, yeah, they don't spend any time bringing that up. Like, oh well, anytime he's fully invisible, and and playing pranks on people or, or going after the Herrix, he's a naked dude. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not not once, not in any Invisible Man movie have I ever seen anybody do the "That's not my hand" joke or something like that. I mean, it just, it just, I mean, they wouldn't have done it then, but it feels like at some point somebody would have done that. Yeah, well, I'm sure in one of one of the more recent Invisible People movies, I think uh, the Elizabeth Moss Invisible Man <laughs> did do that, didn't it? <laughs> you know, I saw that one. It didn't, and actually, there's. My hand. They answer some of the questions we've had about wouldn't this guy have to be naked and wouldn't he have to be freezing? There, there, there. Are, there's explanations for that in that movie, which are who ordered the kielbasa? <laughs> <laughs> I told you I didn't want sausage for breakfast. Yeah, that that really took me out of the movie. I was like, yeah. wow, you guys had me, Blumhouse, and then you had to do this. This seems kind of so crass weird. for this so otherwise uh, serious movie that's really about uh, <laughs> domestic violence. This man movie. Hmm. Uh, anywho. He immediately books it to Sir Jasper's house. Yeah. And just starts fucking with him. In classic it, Invisible Man fuckery. I am uncomfortable with that terminology, <laughs> but I will say... Um, here we were talking about the effects being not a lot new in this, even yeah. though uh, we'll talk about a, a scene or two that I thought was pretty good. But here's the main thing that let me down in this, as far as yes, this is their f- fourth, fifth time around. Yeah, with visibility. Um, the previous movies, but for the most part, one of the things that really worked was they had the actor on set. If they're invisible, their their voice is still being recorded in the same physical space, which at least gave you the illusion that yeah, they're actually in the same room. Right. This movie is so lazy. The sound mixing in this is terrible. It is. Where I mean, the ADR, where clearly John Hall went in a booth to lay in his lines later, it doesn't cut together. It doesn't sound in the same physical space the scene later in in the dun uh, the dungeon in the wine cellar at, th- at the end of the movie you're like why is one person in an actual cellar and the other person's at the spooky ride at disney world it's just the, I, yeah, the weirdest I, I, worst watching this scene in particular i thought are they trying to do the shadow like the way he's laughing and it's all around yes. and like in this weird echoey sort of like <laughs> yeah. you know yeah 
it, it's it's kind of to which I'm like, like it just made me think I wish I was watching a shadow movie. Yeah. <laughs> Here he he is just he's out to fuck with them. So yeah. he is out at least at this point to seem he's trying to be like spectral. He's not like going, I am here, but you can't see me because I'm invisible now. Yeah. Instead, he's like, I will do all the poltergeisty type things that that a ghost might do, and I'll do the creepy laugh and I'll run around them so it sounds like this. And they can't ah, ah, they're losing their minds. Actually, there's a good idea for an invisible man movie. And a man gets invisibility and tries to convince people a house is haunted or something like that. There there's an interesting movie. I'd watch that. Yeah. That would be something. But this there's movie's one thing nothing. This podcast, there's one guy thing this podcast has shown. I'll watch anything. <laughs> yep. You and I, John. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing's like I'd watch that. Holds so little weight to two guys watching these <laughs> these movies. Two men who spent money to buy the complete box set of the... We mm-hmm. each individually bought the Universal mm-hmm. Monsters Blu-ray box set, and we're now talking about them at, at length. We both got them on sale, though. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank, oh, Amazon Lightning deals. So, uh, yeah, I wasn't paying I full say, price. For this. I will say, that's, again, mean. I get a big kick out of these, even the bad ones. Yeah. They are short. And yes. I love films of this period. And when this goes hammy, like yes. they all do, there are moments where I just go, that is some tasty cheese. Cause it's oh, so, is it ever? it's not what we think of horror today. No. no. Um, and actually probably not exactly what audiences of that point by this point in the forties, they didn't think of this as horror. Yeah, Cause they there's nothing like, in this movie that you can even comprehend anyone finding scary. Like when you go back and watch like Dracula or Frankenstein, you can go like, okay, I could understand how this would have creeped people out. There's nothing in say, this that's disturbing. Right at the end, there's, there's a bit of a, Ooh, but I think that's more of a, a thrill or chill. Where Which like is all going, that's promised. So they're not, like, Oh, everything. I think he's actually going to succeed here and goodbye, Freddie. But, I mean, well, that's just for a brief moment. I'm like, damn, they're they're going there. It should be based based on the fact that he seemed to have, you know, pulled like ninety percent of his blood out of his body. But uh, don't worry, he'll be just fine. <laughs> Until you lose a hundred percent of your blood, you're fine. Um, mm-hmm. That seems to be what this movie posits. Uh, so uh, we jumped way ahead. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, I I, I was like, where? Oh, right. Uh, so uh, he says uh, he wants his money, he wants the house, and he wants Julie. Yeah, which is he is. It's not. He's not even dancing around. He's like going, "Oh no no no! I'm full on getting everything you have, yeah. and I'm getting your daughter." Yeah, I'm gonna oh, take yeah. your money. I'm gonna take your house, and then I'm gonna do your daughter. That's right. Because <laughs> she's Evelyn Anchors, yeah. and we all know that is some sweet nineteen <laughs> forty. <1940s. laughs> I, don't, I just gotta stop right there. I don't care if Lon told me to stay away from her. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Are you kidding? If she were asked her choice, I would totally win in that. Me or him? Come on! That's I just like, not even. A I just like the idea. At some point during the making of this movie, Lon Chaney Jr. confronted John Hall. He's like, "You better keep your hands off her." <laughs> I don't need a face full of yak here to kill you. <laughs> Although, I mean, that's pretty pretty easy. Is I don't think they're ever in a scene together. Oh, yeah, true. I mean, that's that's another problem I have with it. Because I like the idea of Invisible Stalker as a movie, too. Like, yeah. if, like, if he was creepily trying to woo her or leaving... I mean, that would have been more interesting. He's, like, leaving her... They don't meet or something like that until he's pretending to be someone else. Right. And, and that is so brief. That is so brief. You, you never get like, you never get any of the, it, he's, he's just, it, she's just a concept. Yeah. But the movie doesn't be, even go to the extent of playing that as creepy where it's like, this guy's in love with a fantasy. Cause it would have been right. if he had met her and she didn't, I mean, the interesting thing once again, is I'm just trying to fix these movies is if he <laughs> met her and she didn't live up to the fantasy he created in his head. And he's like, no, no, you need to do this. You need to say it well, like then, that. The, then it becomes vertigo. Then it becomes him yeah. going, uh, if I could just change your hair. Yeah. Your, your just, hair should uh, be like this. Just, just uh, a little bit. Just make it blonde. That's yeah. Just, <laughs> this is the right shade of lipstick. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so I guess what we're saying is just watch vertigo. Um, you should watch Vertigo. Yeah. God damn, is that a good movie? It's a great movie. Oh, uh, love it. 
Yeah, I've actually been watching. Uh, I also just recently got the Hitchcock, the new Hitchcock box set that they put out. So I, I have been watching it Hitchcock movies. The new Hitchcock uh, box set. Yeah, yeah, new 4K restorations, including the uncut version of Psycho. Oh my God! With all well, the extra stabbings that the censors took out. I now want that. <laughs> it's uh, it's. I mean, it's it's still Psycho. It's actually not that noticeable, but apparently there are like four to five oh, more stabbings no. in all those scenes. I want the box set. <laughs> Oh yeah, because actually, technically, on my sh- in my collection, I really only have Vertigo. Not just not because uh, I don't love the Hitchcock stuff. It's just like, what the hell is that? Um, but yeah, th- that's lacking. I yeah. miss. I miss. Like, I want a good collection. This has got like sixteen of his movies. The one I got, so it's uh, nice. it's 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 pretty good. Anyway, on to better movies. That's how. That's that's when you on know we're in, movies. Well, that's when you know we're in trouble on, on this show. When we start to veering off into other better films. Um, yeah. Let's talk about something that's really amazing. Yeah. Oh, wait. That's not what we're here to Let's talk. just say, we weren't doing this on the Dracula or Frankenstein or original Invisible Man episodes. Um, it's true. All right. So he... Uh, uh, oh, he does have a line here, and this is when I'm going like, okay, so he did murder some people. Once again, would have been nice to have gotten some confirmation. He says... I, uh, I've already, he picks up a knife, uh, Rob does, and he says, I've already killed three men with a knife like this, and I don't mind making it four. Well, he, I mean, he did kill people in, in, in his South escape, Africa. In his escape, right? And that was at least oh, I guess two he was people. already locked up, though. So I guess that he got locked up for the one murder, killed the two people on the escape? That is, sounds likely. So, uh currently here in england he has not killed anybody yet no and he doesn't really until he has to out of necessity so he's i mean he's dangerous but it's another thing where i'm just like he's not dangerous enough he's not enough of a monster for me he's not (laughs) he's not really wreaking enough havoc um yeah He's just, I mean, it's oh, a well, personal that's... vendetta against two people. It's a little boring. I mean, it's a little boring it's for me. It's true. It, it, he, he's not, uh, he doesn't have a high body count. But I will say that the only thing going for this is him being a, a monster. Yes. Is at the very least, he is playing like he just doesn't care. That he will wipe out anyone that gets in his way. He, he but is, again, his yeah. goals are so small. Right. We're not like oh my god the world isn't safe from this invisible man it's like this one small family and anyone who happens to witness things is not safe from this invisible man so because like here he he forces him at knife point to write out a confession for his attempted murder and then transfer all of his property to griffin and i thought well shit it's over he's got (laughs) it he's done it (laughs) just take that and go and you're done (laughs) Dunzo, moving on. <laughs> I, I just, thought, but that—that's the end. That's all he wants. Oh, I guess he also it's, wants to do his daughter, but that just seems impossible because, uh, contrary to what this guy might believe, that's not his property to give away. Uh, his daughter, so it does seem like yeah. That it's not something you can actually demand. It's like um, I, 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 I wish you luck. I, I don't think that she'll agree to this. Yeah. You're welcome to talk to her about taking her away from the man she loves. That's a little bit my, one of my problems with the movie, too, though, is that she's such a non-character that she is property. And that it is this whole thing about, like, well, if I do this, then I get her, right? It is It is very true that they have... They just didn't, in this movie at all, give her not just uh, no autonomy. She just... There's, there's nothing there. We never know what she wants other than I will have happy bland life with happy bland husband, man. Right. Um, so yeah, it's hard for us as an audience to really get worked up as to the possibilities of her life. <laughs> right. She's just going to be handed off to him or handed off to Griffin. It, it's just she. It's it is pretty sad. But it, then again, this is to be expected of these films and the way they've treated their female lead characters. Oh, yeah. But it's just, it's so on the surface of this one that it really, like, yeah. graded on me. Yeah, she she does basically uh, have nothing specific about her other than his lust for her. And that which equals, you, we will be happy together forever once I have all of your stuff which and I have her. It almost seems like the movie would have been more interesting to lose the stuff about the parents and just have it be his insane love for her. And he's 
you know, he kills, maybe he kills the boyfriend and he's killing people around her. And it, it, and it just really is. I mean, I am basically pitching the Elizabeth Moss movie here. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is Enough, better. Go man. Watch. We get it. You really liked it. I did. I love Elizabeth Moss, Invisible Man, a movie we'll cover in 10 years on this show. Um, <laughs> get there. We'll get there. It's, it's really good though. Um, so, uh, let's see. She, uh, uh, oh yeah. So he, uh, my favorite part of this, though, is he finishes writing the confession on the transfer of property, and then Griffin picks it up. He's like, well, let me read this over. I'll go sit in this chair here. And then you actually hear him going, I tried to kill him. Transfer of property. Uh huh. Let's yeah. see. Uh, dotting the eyes, crossing yeah. the teeth. But he's. I mean, he's good? literally going. Bah, 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 trying to do the thing. Nah, nah, nah. Just like <laughs> th- you've lost all sense of menace at this point. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Because while mm-hmm. this is happening, Sir Jasper has grabbed a chair that he's just going to break over him. Because, uh, but uh, of course, he is unable to. And... Well, you know, there's an invisible guy. And one thing we know is that you can't find an invisible person. No, even though he's sitting in the chair in front of you, you still don't have enough time to do this. Uh, and so right after this happens, Irene enters, and Jasper's like, I'm telling you, goddamn, Rob is in this room. And I uh-huh. like Irene's reaction. is like, okay, you need to go to bed. And he's like, no. You know what? It's been a long day. <laughs> My favorite reaction from her, though, is where he goes, no, he's invisible now. And she's like, Jasper, I am so disappointed in you. <laughs> my husband's had a break from reality, and my reaction is, I'm just really disappointed in him. Uh, you're just, okay. You're not the man I thought you were. You're crazy mm-hmm. now. <laughs> you're crazy. Uh, mm-hmm. But, of course, uh, let's see. Uh, she enters. She finds the confession. <laughs> and it's like, right. hey, Jasper, you can't be writing things like this, all right? She has a line somewhat similar like that. It's like, you can't just be writing stuff like this. She's like, I know you've been taking that creative writing course, uh, but uh, we really, you should tear these drafts up. Yeah. And so she's into the fire. She starts to tear it up, and he's like, no, he'll kill us. Like, he's right here. And she says, and this is another one you got to give to the screenwriter there's no such thing as an invisible man. And he says, that's where you're wrong. And he goes over to a fish tank, puts yeah. his hand in the water, and yeah. then puts the water on his face, which is apparently enough water that it shows the features of his face. The effect is okay. Yeah. I actually kind of like the effect. They've done similar ones before, but um, it, it wouldn't have been my first choice as the Invisible Man of like, well, this is what I'll do. But it's enough because Irene cannot handle this shit. No. Like so many people in these movies, when they meet an invisible man, they're just like, Wah! <laughs> She is kind of just wrapped up. Yeah. Wrap her up. She's finished. And I think pretty I much finished for the rest of the movie. I was going to say, I don't actually know if we see her again until she's like only, the she's very end. She's spoken of as being. She's not even like, at the end. No, she's not. She's not in there. So, they talk about her. She didn't die from shock, but apparently she's just she's literally not leaving her bed ever again. <laughs> and uh, Jasper's just like, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'm okay with it. <laughs> she can be a bit much, you know? <laughs> Wives, you get me? And he looks at the camera. <laughs> Am I right, fellas? Am I right, fellas? <laughs> and then it, it does the thing where it turns into a circle in his face, and he's like, <laughs> You got problems with your lady? Try having an invisible man around. Put a little water on his face. That'll fix her. You'll never see that coming, am I right? Um, hmm. Uh, We joke, but we're about to get some of borderline that kind of business in this movie. Um, Oh, Jesus. uh, So anyway. Comedy. Comedy. Rob then barges back and because I guess that's the end of it after she's that Rob just leaves because uh, it just cuts to another scene. Unless like, there was something else they cut, though, I didn't find any reference to it. But it's just so weird that he writes out the confession. He scares Irene into apparently a catatonic state. Uh, yeah. And then it just cuts to another scene. You're like, well, isn't he now going like, well, I'm taking this confession to the police or you're taking it or I'll 
what? No, he's just like, bye. <laughs> John, John, it, do you need this movie spoon fed to you? Are you that kind of an audience member that you're I, like going, please tell me exactly <laughs> everything that's supposed to be happening. Right I know now? I, it's a lot to ask that a movie make this kind of sense, but uh, you know, I guess maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's me. Maybe I'm just too dull for this movie. <laughs> it's a little too dim. Wait a minute. What happened to the, Hey, because once again, it hey. seems like getting him to write this confession should be the end of the vengeance. But uh, it should, this should be able. He should bring him down with this. No, uh, no, because he go. He now goes back to Herbert's. He's in the classic Invisible Man getup. Now he's got the goggles yeah. and the wrap around him and the. He's like, the what coat happened? Did you get burned? Yeah. Are you, what, what happened? You have a skin condition. What did I do? God. <laughs> there, I we can't overstate. There is so much of this guy in the movie. There's he is, a he, ton of him. He's the Invisible Man sidekick in this. Unfortunately, <laughs> instead of just like a a comedic walkthrough, yeah. he becomes his buddy. Something I did and not expect goes, was for him to go back here in this scene. Like I thought, okay, we saw the end of this guy. No, I won't say that they were building great suspense in this film until we got to this guy. But at the very least, the tone was this invisible man is out to fuck some people up and yep. get what he wants. Yeah. So at least it has a threatening tone to it. But the filmmakers are like, we can't trust that. We want more comedy. So comic relief character now gets a lot of screen time. I mean, we're about to go into a, what, 15-minute comedy sequence between this and the next scene with Herbert. I, I, I can't. Do you want to just It's all bits. Do you want to just, you take over it's, here and I'm going to go get something to eat? And you just, you walk the people through this it's, nonsense. It's all I bits. Can't. He comes in and he's like, no, I'm not burned. I'm invisible now. And he lifts up his goggles and you can see that he's invisible. And Herbert's like, what? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I like that he's just like, see, I'm going to stay here. Make me some breakfast, Herbert. Now, now Herbert just works for him. Uh, oh, God. And Herbert's breakfast. like, well, I don't have much for breakfast but some old moldy I, I, I forgot about this part and actually had already jumped ahead to the um the scene in, in the, the pub, pub yeah so, yeah no no so no we get this whole bit is, part is also painful and you reminding me of it is making me hurt he's like don't you wouldn't you rather go down to the inn where they have some nice eggs and he's just like, no, no, just make me the pancakes. He's like, oh, these flowers oh, the got worms here, in it. Yeah, the, geez, the implication here is that he kind of is so freaked out about Griffin now being invisible. He doesn't really want to be this guy's friend anymore because it's too weird. Yeah. And so he's trying to actively discourage him from sticking around and actively discourage Griffin from thinking that this guy will now make food for me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he keeps just going through like, oh, uh, the the flowers got worms in it. He's like going, that's fine. That's never putting anybody off, says Griffin. Yeah. Like, that's weird. And then he goes, oh no, a mouse has been in it. And then Griffin's like, I love pancakes. <laughs> like, I want you to make me some goddamn and, pancakes. And every time he says something, he's like, no, no, I'll make you the pancakes. But oh, oh, look at this. Like everything is just like, number one, Every side character in this movie is just a Monty Python character. Um, it's very like, true. like this really is just, especially when we get to the pub, it is just nonstop. Like, what's this? Who's dead? Let's play the darts. I, I, I do have to say that there is a phone call to uh, the police later in the movie. Yes, that opens literally that scene starts with the line that we always bring up for my actually say it what's yeah, all this then <laughs> what's all this what's all this going on and i'm like jesus christ I, it's exactly the I thing we make fun of I all the time i couldn't believe it we say it as subtext in everything here and he actually like, somebody actually said it in this movie he picks like, up a phone and goes the 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 guy the the reporter guy is like what what's all this <laughs> i know 
I was so delighted that he said that, but also what I mean, just what garbage. If, right? if his name had turned out to be Harry Snapper Organs, then I would have been just delighted. Yeah. But yeah. like, oh my god, the Pythons were just huge fans of the Invisible Man. <laughs> That whole skit was a uh, an homage. Uh, and he said, and then Herbert says, "Well, you know, you, I, I'll let you stay here, but I can't because they're about to throw me out of this place because I don't pay my rent." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then- this becomes this, this labored thing of of like, oh well, we'll get you some money. Trust me, I know how to do it because I'm invisible. Well, here I wrote down his line. He says, "Oh, I'll get you money. I'll get you money." power the ability to hurt people the way they hurt you i'm crazy see well uh, uh, can we just start with the money (laughs) the money was enough for me no it's not really my scene power sounds like a lot of responsibility (laughs) (laughs) well one of the things i do like is that he is always just like how about 50 pounds that's the running bit yeah is that Oh, I'm working on your behalf, and I am uh, trying to blackmail Lord Julius or whatever the fuck. Sir Jasper, I'm always going to Julius. Yeah, I don't know where you want to go to an Orange Julius, is, <laughs> and unfortunately, curse you, Corona. Yeah, I can't go to an Orange. Uh, you know what? Of all the things that have been taken away from me, it's the Orange <laughs> Julius, a drink I haven't consumed in 15, 16 years, probably. Anyway, I just I miss it uh. still. Wait, the coronavirus hasn't been around that long. Oh, you don't make any sense, John. Is that Why haven't right? you been going out for weekly Orange Julius? <laughs> but the whole thing there is that he's like, oh, he wants what he wants. He wants a million and million pounds for his share of the uh, diamond mine. And he's like, going, that's ridiculous. Get out of here. This is a blackmail. He goes, well, why don't we just settle for 50 pounds? Yeah. 50 pounds thing becomes a gag he just wants 50 pounds so they go to this pub and oh boy here's now the scene you were actually dreading uh i i number one they walk into the pub and he closes the door on the invisible man who opens it up behind him and that that hits herbert he's like oh i didn't know you were behind me they do this business which of course could work better if again it didn't sound like john hall as invisible guy was in a sound booth somewhere in burbank but essentially they do terrible stupid business of like i don't know if you're in front of me or behind me why don't you go in front of me and then i'll just follow you and you're like well that's stupid because the invisible man you don't know if he you're gonna bump into his naked ass so then we just get a lot of the invisible man dragging this guy around and pulling him up Mm -hmm. to the bar and it's a lot of business there Mm -hmm. and they're like do you have money to pay for this he's like oh yeah i got money and then he decides to is like why don't you go play some darts every now and then you, Oh, we should also say that the locals at the bar are talking about, there's a headless ghost walking around. Right. People have seen an empty suit of clothes walking around. And everyone's like, there's no such thing. You're drunk. Blah, blah, blah. They're like, no, it's true. There's a ghost. So yay. Right. Uh, that's it exactly. Uh, Mark shows up here because he says, "Yes, I'm writing a story about this invisible man that's here." You say you've got some information about this invisible fella. Uh, and then of course Mark's drink gets knocked over at the bar because I guess somehow he knows that this is Julie's boyfriend. Oh yeah, how would it be established here that he knows this is his rival? I, I have, don't know. I have no idea. Uh, but, uh, then, cause, cause he knocks over the drink and then he's like, you're not good enough for Julie. Yeah. He and, actually says it. And, and, uh, Mark's like, what was that? Cause yeah, I didn't hello? hear anything. And he goes, oh, jeez, I guess I've been working on this case too long. I'm hearing stuff. Am I right? Oh my God. I guess my inner monologue is confirming the fact that I have doubts about this upcoming marriage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then this is where he makes him play darts. Mm-hmm. And geez, I mean, at this point, let's just fucking bring in Bud and Lou, because this scene, number one, this scene kind of happens with a boxing match in that movie as a preview of things to come. 
Uh, so yeah, I mean, at this the whole point, thing is the locals are like, you can't play darts. You never played darts. You're an idiot. And he's like, no, I, I'm, I've always been good. I just been hiding my gifts. Yeah. And, uh, and Rob Griffin just keeps whispering his ear. Like, I got this. Don't worry about it. Just yeah. go through the motions. The other thing so is like, that's insane here is he keeps saying things that are insulting or whatever. And guys are like, what'd you say? But he, John Hall saying it. Here's yeah, a- John Hall saying <laughs> who's invisible says stuff like, "Yeah, your mother sucks, whatever," and sounding like John Hall. <laughs> yeah. And then since he isn't visible, people turn around and it's obviously Herbert <laughs> saying this. And you're like, "Wait a minute, Herbert doesn't sound anything like John Hall." <laughs> no. <laughs> we got a guy well, sounds well, like this. Is, she, she is quite. She could. Oh, there's no getting out of this. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps saying things like that, but you're just like, no, because then John Hall's like, that's right. I said your mother. What? Yeah. I, wait, oh, yeah, I, didn't, uh, I didn't say it because that was clearly a man with an American accent. I love the idea that, I mean, it's not like there's no one looking at Herbert when these things come out of thin air. Yeah. And obviously Herbert's mouth is not moving. So, but... Just because, I guess it has to be him that's saying it. Oh, God, this is painful. And so then he starts... So what we get is a 15-minute comedy bit. A quarter of the movie is taken up with this dumbass, invisible it man. went on forever. It, it. I thought they would do, like, two, and then you're out. You know, it's like no, two, and he wins. They do, like, five. <laughs> Basically, Herbert holds the dart up yeah and and i thought it'd be something like he's going to invisibly work his arm right no i thought that too herbert just puts his arm up so invisible man has or or someone off screen with a wire takes the dart from his hand and zooms it to the dart board and and it looks very awkward Looks very awkward and very slow. Yeah. So even if this guy was an amazing trick shot, because he starts going, "Look, I don't even have to look. I can close my eyes and do it. Look, I can do it from between my legs." Yeah. You're like, no, that is clearly being handled by something I can't see because that's not something thrown. That is <laughs> something being walked. So deliberately. yeah, it's like so you're so you're violating the laws of physics here. Uh... Not just that you're an amazing dart player, but you apparently have a way to bend the space-time continuum. My favorite reaction is after he's thrown a few of these, somebody says, It's bleeding hypnotism. Yes, it's bleeding hypnotism. (laughs) Bleeding hypnotism? (sighs) Sure. What? So, he wins after 18 minutes. (laughs) Um, well, and then he finally throws like six, and they all go in, and whatever. Yes, it's like, yeah. yes. he's yeah. like, these are the same darts. They check him out. I was like, there's nothing wrong with these darts. And he goes, well, I guess I'm done. And the whole bunch of them go in. They're like, what? That's insane. And then we'll get to it when we get body. to it. But that boxing scene in Abner and Costello is a better version of this. Well, maybe they had time to think about where they could have gone right with this scene. <laughs> And uh, they had plenty of time between this and and uh, I got so. Believe it's seven it. years that we get before we get to that. So, Megan. <laughs> so, um, so guy he was betting against is not satisfied with that. Isn't going to give him the money. Mm-hmm. So then bar brawl breaks out, and of course, Invisible Man does some Invisible Mannery to take the guy down, and everyone's spooked. It's another classic scene though, where Herbert puts his hands over his eyes, and the guy gets punched out, and everybody somehow still believes that Herbert punched him out. Man, yeah. And then it, I, it just, and then Herbert of course like, happy. anybody else want some? And everybody's like, oh. <laughs> there's plenty more where that came from. And and I'm on the floor rolling with laughter. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was great. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> Oh, it was God. so good. And I was just like, isn't this movie about murder? Like, <laughs> Oh, wasn't there some revenging that needed to go on? Nah. Well, first we need Herbert's revenge on the town. <laughs> You'll get what's coming to you, Shropshire, or whatever the hell the name of this town is. I can't. It, it's it's said maybe once ever in this movie. Uh, they do show the, the town sign. I yeah. just don't remember what it was called. It doesn't matter. So this is uh, another one where I, I thought, Something has to have been cut out here because we cut into a scene where Mark 
and Jasper are like standing with Julie and she's so con- they're so concerned about her. They're like, yeah. "Oh, you haven't been eating anything for days." I'm like, "What? We just came in in the middle of a scene and Julie hasn't even been in the movie since that first scene until now." It seems like we probably did miss a scene with Julie looking after her mother, which is yeah. the whole point. She's the, so worried about how mom is just gone all to shit. Yeah. Something that her, she can't even look after herself. Jasper's not worried about his wife, but she's worried about her mom. Yeah. Oh, she's fine. <laughs> she's fine. She saw an invisible... Well, you you know, you can't see an invisible person. She experienced an yeah. invisible person. She That's became all. aware an invisible person was in the room, drove her kind of kooky, Ah, it happens. Ah. <laughs> These things happen. You know, as parents, we probably did not prepare you for it, but we should have said, eventually you will encounter an invisible being, and it'll fuck you up for a while. Sooner, it's, it's what we call growing up. Sooner or later, everybody meets an invisible person. It just happens. It's a, it's a passage. Rite of passage. Rite of passage. I'll never forget hey. my first invisible man. Did you see your invisible person yet? Well, you know, you can't see them. But yes, I did. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, so we get all but this. Yet, yeah, but yeah. this is the first time, like, Julie's back. Frank has only been sort of this running background character. He hasn't been that important, but whatever. Um, What happens now? Is this where he goes? Well, they where, say, they say she's... Like, She'll never end up with you as long as you're invisible. Well, Irene, Irene is saying, ah, oh, she's just up there babbling about invisible mans and griffins and then yeah and then mark says what griffins Griffins. did did your family know a man named griffin and she says no well i kind of remember something about a man named griffin but i also think he died and uh as they're putting this uh so let's see uh, so then uh, Julie's like, oh, well, anyway, who cares about that? I need to go check on mother again. And this is where Cleghorn comes back in and says, well, I feel it's my obligation, sir, because yeah, you're right. part of the family now to tell you that a man named Griffin did show up the other day. And apparently Griffin just happens to be in the house at this point because he pushes yeah. what the sculpture or whatever down at them. This, I mean, that, that could be cool. Uh, as in, for some reason, he's like, "Fuck these people," and I, I, I will give away my presence essentially by tossing the sculpture down. The visual effect doesn't work. No, because you know, I they could have just with a little wire tipped over this ceramic or whatever this sculpture off the thing, and obviously, obviously, the actors know where to stand; they'll be safe. Because it's not supposed to be hitting anyone on the head. But what they do instead was this glass photography trickiness. Yeah. So you see the the vase or sculpture go over and yeah. fall and hit, but it's clearly on a different glass plane. It smashes very impressively, but then there are pieces of it that are, are they should be on a floor, but they're hanging midair like they're on top of the people the actors down there um, as if they were the, the, the flat plane of the floor. Right. And, and if they had done it quickly, maybe that also could have been avoided. But I was like, Ooh, not a good optical effect guys. That no. did not work. No, 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 not at all. Um, and then I like that. They're like, man, that almost hits you. Yeah. yeah. All right then. <laughs> yeah. The, it's not really addressed other than, wow, what a weird accident, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but then, uh, Rob, uh, who's still invisible, of course, at this point, grabs Jasper and pulls him into the library where he's, he's talking about like, you need to get that man out of here. He'll never marry Julie. I'll marry Julie. Uh, and, uh, I wrote down this line, which is, uh, Jasper saying, how could Julie marry you? You're inhuman. Yeah. And then, I, but I also like that Griffin goes, well, what do you mean? <laughs> the, 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 cause he's what are you like, talking about? Could never marry you. He's like, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. What? What do you? Uh, come on, what, say it. Deal? What do you want? Yeah, come on, call me invisible. Come on, uh, just say it. <laughs> All right, because you're invisible. I know. What? It. You bigot. <laughs> You've always headed out for invisible people. <laughs> this whole thing is just so the idea is now 
in Griffin's head that, huh, maybe the usefulness of being invisible, of uh, being invisible has reached its end maybe. because maybe Julie can't love an invisible man. Yeah. Hmm. Now, once again, what came of that? I'm still thinking about what came of that confession and transfer of right. property that he wrote out. Yeah. That's um, never yeah. mentioned ever again. It's not. <laughs> But I do like it. He's got him at knife point here, and he's like, so you're saying if I wasn't invisible, I could marry Julie? He's got a knife to his throat, and he's like, yeah, that's what yeah, I'm, I'm saying. Other than being invisible, I, I see no problem with it. I think you're totally stable. Uh, nice fella. We were friends back in Africa. Sorry he, about the whole leaving you for dead thing, but other than that, we're good buddies. And then he just decides, well, then I'll be visible again, knowing yep. that the doctor had told him you can't be. Yeah, uh, but you know his timing in this is excellent because Perfection. when he when he when he looks up his old friend Doctor Drury at that exact Dr. moment <laughs> has actually just successfully uh, and he's looking through the window at this, which means yeah. that anyone on the street, if you had walked up, <laughs> would be seen. able to see a mad scientist turning an invisible dog back into visibility. Yeah. Um. So yes, he he successfully brings uh Brutus. Yeah. Uh, played by Grey Shadow. Yeah. And once um, again, to- the hero of the movie. Yeah, absolutely. Brings him back to visibility, and he's he's absolutely fine. He's like, that's a good boy. Look mm-hmm. at you. You're awesome. Look how you came back from being invisible. You're great. Yeah. Uh, and that's when Griffin comes in. He's like, hey, I want some of that. Yeah. I think is the actual line of dialogue, right? Yeah. He hey, in, hey. I, I, want, I want some of that. Give me some of that. Uh, Give me some of that visibility stuff. He's like, I already told you, you can't turn back. And he's like, I just saw you turn that dog back. He's like, yeah, well, what you didn't see was I had to drain all the blood out of another dog. So that dog's yeah. dead now, which is fucking yeah. crazy, by the way. This, okay, all right. Now, granted, the Invisible Man films are based off that one novella by H.G. Wells, and they've that's gotten, all sci- They've gotten sci-fi so much mileage shit. out of it. <laughs> and it's sci-fi bullshit from the 19th century, essentially. Yeah. So. Yeah. Or early 20th. Yeah. Um, so th- there's no rules. It's not like vampirism or even lycanthropy. No. Um, so just like with the Frankenstein movies, they're free to just make shit up as yeah. to how it happens. We're no longer talking about monocane or duocane. Uh, this we is just should a, be. That would be easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but this is another soci- This is a sociopath who became invisible and is no more crazy visible or invisible. So that has nothing to do with it. But here... True. Just this, just this nonsensical bullshit thing of, oh, well, yeah, the cure to the invisibility is I pump a full other, hu- I mean, living beings' blood into your body, and that will make you visible again. Uh, which is insane on a, on a few levels. Number one, you're killing another living being to just fuck around with invisibility. And two, you now have the equivalent amount of blood of two human beings in your body? Yeah, that, you, that you can't, and that... You, you nowhere can't. for it to go <laughs> and uh also again uh but this is true of almost all these films especially the vampire films it's like no one bothers to type this blood here or there nope no oh, that doesn't matter just any blood will do what will do which was the subtitle of this one but then on any top of blood that do. they add in this wrinkle that that only lasts for a while yeah which, what yeah so it's you become essentially like a vampire where you will have to continually refill up with someone else's blood. I mean, they can do whatever they want, but I'll just say this. I don't like this. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I have to apologize for our listeners because John's usually so even-headed, calm, cool. It's, yeah. And that outburst just now, I'm sorry you had to hear it. Yeah. And you know what? I apologize. I was out of line. That was, that was, you that was over were. the line. That was over the line. You know what? You go back in time and apologize to Bertram. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I want you to go back I and just... say, I, I didn't Look, mean it. You did a fine job. I, I know. I know you can never fully forgive me for what I've said. Uh, it just, you can't come back from those Bertram words. Bertram R.I.P. No. <laughs> I won't come after your great work again by the way i love the name millhauser um it's good it's good uh yeah so he's like uh oh drain another human being of their blood i've got just the guy there's some asshole trying to marry my beloved julie we'll just suck all his blood out put it in me and we're good to go 
Sounds like a plan. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's like, so this is what you're going to do. Yeah. You, uh, you're saying this you're going to call that uh, you're going to call Frank, the reporter, and you're going to get keep, him over you here. You keep calling him Frank. His name is Mark. <laughs> I think I, in my head, want him to be the Freddy. <laughs> yeah. And I think I've combined Mark and Freddy into Frank. <laughs> you're going to call Mark. Yeah. That is his name. That is yeah. correct. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you're here because <laughs> I, I, I've been confusing people for the last 20 minutes. Um, they're, they're going back gonna, like, I watched this. Where was there a Frank? Um, you know what I'm sure of? No one is going, I watched this. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these, <laughs> yes. Not this one. About. Only we watch this one. <laughs> only we. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we're the only ones that are going to watch next week's. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, so that's the plan is we're going to call Mark. He's going to come over and then we're going to knock him out and yep. drain his blood. Yep. But Dr. Drury is not a mad scientist. No. He refreshingly, like, I mean, yeah, he's eccentric and, and he's definitely arrogant. But uh, he's not down for killing people. No, he sounded a little bit like me in the scene by saying, I don't like that. I don't like that. But you know what? You're crazy and invisible, so I'm going to go ahead and make that phone call. So he goes over and he calls. He calls the cops, but pretends he's calling the reporter. huh? And this- Which is where we get, what's all this thing? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and... Hello, love, stereotypical British cop here. Yeah, typical British cop who doesn't believe him. Like, oh, you need to sleep it off. Um, because this is crazy talk. And, but Jury keeps going. He's like, yes, I have the Invisible Man here. I captured him. You should come and check this out. Um, yeah. Reporter, whose name is not Frank, yeah. but is in fact Mark. <laughs> and the cop's like, whatever, and hangs up. Oh, yeah, we'll be right over. Yeah, we're on our way. Right over, yeah. Um, and then so immediately decides, up. I better give him a call back just to make sure that wasn't crap. Um, Yeah. So he calls again, Which, and this time, this time, Rob answers. Rob, he picks it up. Uh, and he's just like, yeah, this is the police. We got a call from this number saying that they captured an invisible man. Is that by any chance true? He's like, oh, no, no, no. That's, um, nope. Yeah. All nope. right. Well, that's what we thought. Yeah, well, great. <laughs> this isn't by any chance an invisible man. Yeah. No, I'm certainly visible. Right. Yeah. Well, sorry to have bothered I you. I do like good police work not to, even if you go, there aren't such things as an invisible man, you might go, let's look around and see if, you know, something's going on over at that address. Nope. Never mind. All clear. Click. Doopity doo. Oh, God. So this has really made Rob Griffin not so not so happy with the doctor who has lied to him. No. Yeah. He's, he's not happy about this at all. Uh, so he just punches out the doctor and says, uh, I'll just drain your blood then. Here comes a big problem in this movie. <laughs> a huge problem. All right. Rob Griffin. Yeah. No scientist. No as, doctor. Nope. He did watch through a window <laughs> as an actual scientist. Picked it up like the that. Blood or put the blood into a dog. Yeah. Uh, and was possibly. No, he was he was unconscious when he became invisible. So he didn't even see that procedure. But somehow this allows him to know how to drain a human to set up a a uh, uh, a blood transfusion between him and Dr. Drury. I think that's another part he can of just it. Do it. Not only does he know how to do it, but he's able to do it while being part of said blood transfusion. Yes. It, they show him actually doing like this the a pump with the the syringe plunger as if that's how he's operating it. Maybe that can work. And maybe an actual doctor would be able to do that. Stay conscious, be able to do this, to sit there and do their own blood transfusion. Look, hey, if you're a phlebotomist, please. Please give us a Please, call. yeah, yeah. Give we us have, a call at this number. We have a toll-free line. Uh. <laughs> and the third caller gets tickets to go see, I don't know, Iggy Azalea in concert. <laughs> Isn't uh, she uh, who the kids are listening to these days? I don't know, pulled a name out of thin air. That was pretty good. And I mean, I think it was at least a name that was not Frank. <laughs> you get tickets to see Frank. You get tickets to see Frank. 
Um, I'd go see that. Hey, in fact, I did watch that movie. That was a delightful movie. Oh, the Fast uh, Man. Yeah. yeah, it was good. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, he's able to do this, and sure enough, it works. Yep. He's visible again. Yep. But guess who's not so happy about what's been going on here? Brutus. Gray Shadow has been. <laughs> Gray, I like Gray Shadow better than Brutus, but yes. What's well, interesting is Gray Shadow is credited as himself, not Brutus, in the credits. That's true. They should have given his character name. They keep calling so, him Brutus, but then he's himself in the credits. So yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but yeah, he's been barking all the way through the scene anyway because his master has been killed and drained. Yeah. Um, but uh, Which so is just. Number one, insane. You pull all all of someone's blood out. I don't. I don't. Is, I and don't then, get it. And then why, put why it in your body. Wait, I, John. Sometimes you don't make any sense. I don't. I <laughs> you don't know, know. You know what? Honestly, what I would have accepted more, and it's still stupid, is if the blood just transferred between them, and now John Carradine's invisible. I would have. I would have <laughs> believed that more than what is happening in this movie. Oh. What is this? I oh, I, I'm I'm as invisible as you are. Why? We still never I, get two invisible men in a movie, which is what I want, so that we can have an invisible fight. A fight, which would just be prop guys off camera throwing <laughs> ceramics at each yeah, other. Yeah, just like here, come it, here, you. It'd be, yeah, they'd be doing live foley right off camera. Is all it would be. A, as there's just an empty frame of the sounds of struggling. <laughs> Doing that, ah, oh, you <laughs> bastard! Uh. <laughs> and then a chair knocks over thanks to a wire. Hey, thanks to the show we we do. I've had to fight with myself on stage, so you know, I mean, look, that's it, true. It can That's be done. true. It can uh, be done. Fuck. It's always fun. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> we never fight. We never get that. John Carradine's just dead and out of the picture at this point. Yeah, he's done. Yeah. Uh, but at at the same time as this is happening, this is intercut with. Mark showing up at the police station. Once again, what great timing, because he's like, uh, hey there, fellas, uh, you got any scoop about this invisible man? And the cop is just like, I well... I really dying for a story. <laughs> In any, any story. I have nothing going on. Well, somebody did just call a few minutes ago saying that they captured the invisible man. But and then- what's more, they were asking for you. Yeah, isn't that strange? Uh, and, uh, the, yeah, it, he's just like, well, let's go over there and check it out then. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> so off they go. And then, uh, as they're on their way, now, uh, Rob, who's visible again, starts dousing the place in ether. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the dog is barking like crazy. Uh, Gray Shadow is, is, uh, is really uh, barking like crazy. And, uh, he uh, he lights the place up, and I th- I was worried for the dog. Although I thought they probably won't do anything to the dog. I did not expect the dog to have as as big a role in the third act as he does. Uh, no. I thought he was just going to escape. And that'd be the end of it. But uh, no, 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 no. This this dog is uh, this. It suddenly becomes Gray Shadow's revenge. Um, it really does, and I'm I'm down for that. Weirdly, but you would have to build this up a little bit more. <laughs> But regardless, he does escape. Oh, you guys who are worried about the dog, don't. Don't well, you worry. Mark comes in as the place is burning, and he grabs uh, Dr. Drury's body and carries it out. And the uh, Brutus is just able to get free of his uh, harness and, and leap out yeah. the window. Yeah, quite dramatic. Goes right out the window. Goes Pretty cool. right out the window. And then it cuts to Rob showing up at Sir Jasper's place, and that dog is right on his heels. How close is this place to Dr. Drury's? Because that dog is right there after him. I just, he, Gray Shadow must have amazing senses. Like yeah. um, just amazing smell. Maybe, you know, the, being invisible gives you heightened everything else. Because he was invisible at one point. But he has no problem tracking Rob down. Nope. I did. I did write down the dog somehow has chased Rob to Jasper's. Um, somehow it happened. Uh, yeah. So he comes. This is where the movie is starting to grate on me a little bit because now he's visible Whoa, again. <laughs> <laughs> but it took this long. Well, so now he's visible and he co- he shows up at Jasper's and he's like, "Hey, 
I want the mansion. I want the money. I want Julie. It's just like he, you're not. He's not doing enough. He just keeps showing up. He shows up like three, four times. The other movie just goes, "Hey, just give me all your stuff. Yeah. Give me all just your stuff. Give me all your stuff. We're yeah. not done. We are not done. What's give me all your goddamn stuff. Kill somebody or do something. I don't know. He's just not. He's not a particularly active, invisible man. No. Again, it's his his focus is so narrow that this is all they've given him to do, yeah. and. And I, I like a story that's about a complete obsessive revenge story, but it's it's just not done, done well. No, no. It's just uh, – yeah, because it, well, it's just like, I'm invisible. Give me all your stuff. And then he's like, all right, now I'm invisible again. Now give me all your stuff. And your daughter. Hand her over. Maybe you didn't hear me when I said – Give me all your stuff and your daughter. And there's the the thing that's insane to me is there's never any reason for him to leave. Like he's always just like, "Give me all your stuff. I don't have it. Well, I I, I gotta go though." <laughs> so at this point, uh, he's visible again. Yeah. But um, you know, he's like, there's the threat of people coming over, like uh, Mark and Julie and Cleghorn, and he's like, I. I'm not going if anyone comes in I'm not uh I'm not Rob Griffin. You're going to call me I can't remember what the other name was. I can't what I can't remember what it is either. Uh and he goes, yeah, but Cleghorn scene, he's like going, you tell him to play along or he's dead too. He's like, damn, all, all, all right, man. By geez. the way, Cleghorn's totally on the chopping block. Cleghorn should have been murdered in this movie. Yeah. Maybe they're going maybe they're getting softer in their old age these universal films because Usually a manservant or a maid, they're dead. Oh, we've <laughs> seen tons of them killed. Yeah, they've been, they're just cannon fodder. I just, but, I mean, I know I sound bloodthirsty, but it's just like, I just want some mo- more monstrous action from this invisible man. He kind of is just an ass. Like, he's not, you know, yeah. and, and even still, he only kills John Carradine because he's like, well, I need to be visible. It's not like, yeah. it's not particularly like you've wronged me. I mean, it's more, no, it's more just like, you ruined my chance to kill the guy I really want to kill, so now I have to kill you because I need to be visible. Well, what's interesting is, again, uh, there is, of course, he is unstable, so he's not rational. But the whole thing of, it's like, okay, yeah, he screwed you over with that call to the cops, but the cops aren't going to come over. You know that. They didn't believe And him. there's no... There's time limit on this thing it's not julie's getting married tomorrow and i have to woo her as rob griffin oh. tonight so <laughs> there's the a thing, thing the screenplay could have done sure put a you know taking clock in it there's no taking clock so he didn't have to go well you're the closest body <laughs> he could have found somebody else at some point or found another way to get to mark like yeah. since you're invisible going to his house and then killing him. Yeah. And since he apparently already knows how to do the blood transfusion himself, he all, he could just steal the equipment from the doctor, and the doctor never would have had to be party to any of this nonsense. Also, yeah. it would have given Mark more motivation if, if he'd been dropping bodies throughout the movie, and they're like, there's an invisible killer out there, and that's what I'm you tracking. You are bloodthirsty. All you care about is, can we kill some more people? Yes, that is it exactly. <laughs> You are a twisted human being. I know. It's such an unusual request in, you know, a horror film that people might get killed. Uh, that's it's just... true, though. This one this one is pretty light. There's a lot of heavy intent, yeah. but not actual. No, for the guy uh, who's described as, early on in the movie, a homicidal maniac, there's a lot of, like, because if you don't. If you don't, I am so going to mess you up. Be troubled at some point. That you get even, you get three more chances, uh, you know. I don't even recognize you when I'm done. Yeah, it's like, well, can you give me some time frame on when you're going to start? Because so far it's a lot of talky talk. He already wrote out that confession. Why not just murder both of the Herricks and go? They came at me. They were trying to kill me. Here's their confession. That all makes perfect <laughs> sense to me. Never would have even had to do any of this shit. That uh, makes perfect. Anyway, all right, let's get into the end of this movie. So he, oh, he's going by Martin Field, by the way, is the name that Martin he's. Field. You call there me, you call me Martin Field, and I do like this with Cleghorn's. Like, no, that's Griffin. No, he's Martin Field. Yeah. Cleghorn's like, no, oh, this is Griffin, the guy you told me to. No, 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 no. Martin 
Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I'm very sorry, sir. <laughs> uh, for some reason, I was doing the Cockney accent, and and, and yeah. the butler does not. That was like, oh it, yes, of course. Well, yeah. Mr. Martin Field. Sure. Martin Field. The, that's right. That's right, um, Leghorn. <laughs> and then again, he again the rules on this are totally stupid anyway. But he has to know this isn't going to last very long. The whole visibility thing. Right. I thought it was interesting that Gray Shadow gets the one injection of a, of another dog mm-hmm. and remains visible throughout the whole rest of the movie. Yeah, that doesn't seem to affect him. No. But uh, well, that could have been another Rob invisible Griffin. fight we could have had. <laughs> that invisible dog on Invisible Man action. Which Arr, is hey! Very Arr, specific oh, get off me, you dog! <laughs> you have to sign in with your age before you can see that shit. <laughs> but, um... So, yes, they... He, but he seems pretty cocky about it. Like, I'm just going to hang out here at the estate yeah. as this Mark Field guy. <laughs> so here comes uh, Mark and Julie, and he's just like, hi, how you doing? I'm Martin Field. And, I, and he even I'm says, and I'm, totally gonna, and I'm going to be And I'm going to be staying here for a long, long time. <laughs> and Julie will be my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did I tip my hat too early? Uh, just ignore that <laughs> last part. Prone to that. Sorry. Anyway, she will be mine. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, no, totally sane. <laughs> totally reasonable. Uh, give her to me. Um, yeah. So uh, we 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 end the night on the dog howling outside. That dog makes it clear he's not going anywhere until this he's is not finished. Going anywhere. This is this is his his revenge and he's going to make him pay i never expected that the dog was going to become the mcduff of this uh <laughs> <laughs> and yet that is exactly what happens yeah. and i'm sure that and i'm sure that shakespeare was totally in bertram's <laughs> mind when he was writing this you know what here's a chance i'll do a little macbeth illusion and they'll get it in 2020 um <laughs> <laughs> and i'll get full credit yeah so, yeah, so then it, it's the next morning. He just spent the night there and nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> you know, it would have been nice. Once again, I want a creepy scene where he's watching Julie sleep or something. Arr! Just there's nothing There's nothing scary or unnerving in this movie. No. Uh, again, uh, the only thing unnerving is his blinkered devotion to this concept of getting his money and getting yeah. Julie. But even then, you're like, okay. It's just more of the same. You're just going to keep on with your little uh, bring it back of give me this. I, I, I'll wait right here until I get the stuff I want. Let me pitch this, and this is more death for the movie. What if he had murdered the wife, and then uh, the 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 guy is like, Julie shows up. She's like, where's mom? Oh, she was called away because he's too scared to indicate that anything's going on or like the invisible man i don't i want the invisible man not to leave the house like what if he was just a lingering presence in the house all the time yeah if if that kind of threat if you're going to make the focus that narrow um and it is just really about these this one little family and these people then why not go that direction where he's it and the first movie did that a little bit where he came after the assistant guy and stayed in his place is like yeah. you can't leave i will see everywhere you go you're going to do what i tell you to do um and you can't fuck with me because i'm an invisible man so that was actually fairly tense like that actually yeah. did work um there are things in that movie that worked a lot and there aren't that many in this that do well anything. i mean all this leads back to that first invisible man movie is great yeah <laughs> It's uh, fantastic. With with every week as we go forward, uh, it makes those originals, the the early ones, look that much better. Yeah, they're they're amazing. Uh, they are. Uh, so they get up the next morning. Herbert shows up, going, "All right, I want my money now." Yeah, you promised me money, and yeah. he's like, "Look, you'll get your goddamn money as soon as you kill that dog." Because the dog he, is still howling outside. And he's like, really? He's like, yeah. And I did like this part where he goes, I fear nothing oh. except that dog. He's the only living thing I'm afraid of, is what he says. Yeah. The, and it's, and, the, and, and I, even Herbert's I, like, I really? Yeah. Re- wait, back up. <laughs> Serious? Okay. I do like the idea that the dog is just out there going, hey, hey, Griffin. 
Get out of here. <laughs> Face me, you coward. I wish they had Come dubbed on. you in as the voice Come on. Of, of Brutus. That's so great. Hey, hey Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> let's I finish this up huh, pal <laughs> this is late in the podcast Luke, and that is killing me <laughs> well by and the time I, it's definitely late in the show by the time i'm giving it yeah <laughs> i was gonna say it's definitely late in the show by the time i'm giving a dog a voice uh that yeah. that's that's usually a sign that we're close to the end of things here um yeah, we are about to wrap up hang with us folks <laughs> we're almost done with griffin uh he's the only living thing i'm afraid of and so he says uh well, I'm not afraid of him. I'll go kill that dog right now. And he offers him a thousand pounds to go murder this dog. Yeah. He's like, a thousand pounds? All right, then. Uh, uh, he did not succeed. Again, spoiler <laughs> audience, he, he he fails as a dog killer. Yep. Uh, what do you think? You think you're going to take me out, huh, tough guy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking Gray Shadow. <laughs> Forget about that Brutus nonsense. Right. I know who I am. That's right. You come at me, you drunken bastard. <laughs> drunken character actor bastard with your prolonged, unfunny comedy bits. Yeah, that's right. In a couple of years, we'll make a movie where you're my owner, but let's not get into that right now. Because <laughs> apparently, yeah, they do make another movie where Leon owns the uh, the dog. But the plot still revolves around him trying to kill him for a thousand pounds. <laughs> You hear me, dog? Um, Come here, my old friend. Hey, yes, oh, don't look at the club in my hand. <laughs> no, it's just your old friend. Come on over here. Uh, so let's see. Uh, uh, Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, it's the breakfast table and Mark is there explaining... Yeah, it was the strangest thing. Uh, we found the scientist in a burning building. He'd been completely drained of his blood. Really yeah. weird. And then I love that Rob enters, introducing himself as Martin Field. He's just like, well, I'll tell you what it probably is. This invisible man. He probably needs blood to be visible. I will say that uh, it is totally stupid writing. At the same time, often when you read these true crime things about serial killers... They often do this shit. Yeah. They often give themselves away as if they're just being like, well, I'm a clever outsider and I, I had nothing to do with the murder, but you know what I think the guy probably did? And then they will outline it exactly the way they did it because they have such an ego. So in a weird way, and I'm giving Bertram way too much credit again, it's yeah. Brendan's too yeah. much credit corner. Yeah. Um, but yes, we it's weren't not, talking a lot about serial killers in 44. So it's, no, <laughs> that term wasn't even around. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, they did, uh, that's some clever character work where it's someone's that insane and arrogant that, you know, it's like, you know what, I'll tell you what I essentially did. I'm just not going to claim that I did it. Uh, was, and it's cocky. And this is the only scene we get with him and Julia. I wish he was creepier towards her. I wish he was, cause he's talking about like, maybe this invisible man needs to be visible because he loves somebody. And I really wish he had like given a look to her, like, cause he, loves someone yeah they they don't even give I mean, you're right they don't they don't they for, don't give that here at all for a movie that has no subtlety in it to begin with let's go all in yeah instead he's weirdly trying to put on a totally normal face for, <laughs> for them same like, man uh, i'm totally saying now i am gonna keep talking to you about this theory about an invisible dude and the draining of blood and then of course i did like the one shout out where it's like uh it's like draining the blood to become visible again what is he dracula and then they all turned and looked at the camera and we're like they all look at the camera and they go a fine universal film from 1931 <laughs> uh that one's for you bela hope you're doing okay uh, and then I like uh, he goes to pour a pitcher of something, and uh, just as he's saying this, Mark's going like, "Yeah, but the effect would probably be temporary, right?" And of course, immediately at that moment, Rob realizes his hands have turned oh. invisible, and also yeah. he's turned. I... They say pale. That's not the word for what this is. They've caked no. him in clown makeup, basically. Even it's, his it's... hair is white. 
the it's blood the didn't that, get to his hair. I, well, I think that this is also setting up the pretty cool effect I was going to say. So I, I think weirdly for makeup purposes, they had to go that route. Mm. I did laugh, not my ass off, but I laughed a little with the whole, it's, it's, it's such a trope in, in movies, especially badly made movies where it's like, well, uh, I guess at some point, maybe wouldn't he start becoming visible again? And then it happens immediately. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's, it's like them going, well, you know, uh, it is the night of the full moon, and then someone looking at ah, ah, my uh, the fur the on my moon. hands is so goofy. But I think the yes, he goes totally pasty, like clown white, yeah, pasty, yeah. and yeah, shoe polish and the hair white, and then he's like, oh, I seem to have cut myself. I have to go dress my wound and run out of the room. My favorite part is he runs out of the room, and it still stays in the room, and Evan Lanker just goes, "Did he look kind of pale to you?" Did he seem? I mean, yes, he had just maybe cut himself, but he seemed pale. But not pale, more ghostly white. <laughs> yeah. So the next scene of him running through the hall as he's fading mm-hmm. is a nicely done effect. It is actually, yeah. Um, because this isn't like the other like time lapsey type things. So the highlights of his face are still visible. You can see that's there, but you can see through the darker shaded parts of his, his body. And it's all in, in a continuous shot of him running down the hall that you're seeing through him. And uh, yeah, for 1944, I was like, Oh, they hadn't used this effect in the previous movies. And I like it a lot. Um, yeah. But you see a few seconds and it's done. Yep. But there, it was cool. There was the highlight of the movie, everybody. <laughs> and thanks for watching Invisible Man. <laughs> so he runs into the into the bathroom of his bedroom past this maid who's doing his bed. And she was like, oh, I didn't see you there. Uh, <laughs> I yeah, didn't see you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, she's, and she's going on. And she's babbling on about something. And so he's in the bathroom now, invisible. And he, he says, well, hey, could you go get Mark for me and tell him I, I need to see him for a second? Oh, and and it's a private thing. So if you, could you wait till he's alone to tell him? And she's like, "This isn't weird at all. Absolutely, sir. I'll do that exact thing." Look, I've been a maid for a very wealthy family for a while. This is far from the weirdest shit I've seen. <laughs> and you don't need anything like lard or whipped cream. <laughs> Great. I don't have to disappear anything, do I? Okay, perfect. <laughs> In this household, you have to believe what you can see. What? No, it's stupid. Moving on. Anyway. He tried to work that line of the reverse in there, but he just he couldn't find a natural way to do it. That's not organic. Ugh, damn. Ugh, it would have been a good. Not, they damn, never worried about what was organic. <laughs> so she runs downstairs. Yeah. She says. Mark. She says, uh, uh, Mr. Field needs to see you upstairs. He goes upstairs. He's not there. But there's a letter that says, hey, the secret thing I need to show you is in the wine cellar. Come yeah. down there alone. Yeah. And talk Again, to me. No, nothing weird about this. I don't know why you keep putting this weird emphasis on it. Mark has no, no weird, is not weirded out at all by this. And he just goes downstairs to the wine cellar. This is the dude who literally, I mean, uh, four minutes ago had been uh, postulating on, well, you know, the invisible guy is probably draining people so he can become invisible again. And so naive, stupid, you know, Mark is like, oh, that's, uh, yeah, sounds fine. You know, I don't know. I'm not suspicious at all. You know, it would have been cool once again. What if he had seen him turning invisible a little bit, and then that led him to more knowingly, kind of like that Ben Helsing scene in the first Dracula, be like, you know, if this invisible man was here, yeah, his invisible, it probably wouldn't be permanent. Like, make Mark smart. <laughs> I I have always liked those scenes in films very often in a Van Helsing thing where it is like, you know what. I'm going to let you know I'm on to you. Yeah. And I'm going to do it in the the coolest sort of casual way. I like those kinds of scenes, and I would have appreciated that here. But no, Mark's like, sounds legit. I'm going to the wine cellar. Oh. Hey, hey this guy might have a scoop for me. 
Doop, 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 doop. Better get out my pen and pad. Doop, 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 doop. Hey there, Mr. Field. What was that you were saying? Here comes the scoop. Here comes the scoop. Daddy needs the scoop. <laughs> he puts on his fedora with a little press card in it, and he's like, all right, what's the I'll scuttlebutt? Be there. I'll be there presently. Let me find my little press card. There it is. Doop, doop, doop. Well, I'm on the uh, job. Uh, I have to wear the hat. Um, yeah. it's, like, it's the only way this works. Now, so pretty quickly, the door shuts behind him, and Mark is trapped down in the wine cellar. Yep. And, <laughs> and uh, finds, uh, what's this, tubing and needles? Uh-oh. <laughs> and finds that, um, that Mark Field's personality has shifted not just to sociopathic uh, killer, but now he's full-on, like, cackling madman like mm -hmm, you wanted to see the invisible man <laughs> well here he is and now also I, I need your blood and this is the thing is like we hear a couple of lines of dialogue from mark not much once the fighting starts actually yeah. he doesn't make much noise at that point but so we know what it sounds like in that cellar but yeah. the second that that uh, Rob Griffin starts to talk, this is where I'm saying it sounds like he's on. He is the recording they use at a at a fair in their spooky shack. It is the goofiest, clearly not in the same physical space that the other person is with Come echo and and bouncing off the walls. I'm like, oh man, come on. John Hall could not be bothered to show up for this. No, no, but I will say he gives it his all, and I do think that he had a blast yeah. playing. Um, this is against uh, type for him. I think he's having fun. Yeah, he is a bad dude. Yeah, uh, in a very dumb movie. So yes, here comes Invisible Man versus Visible Man fight. Um, yeah, they 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 struggle a bit, and eventually Rob does knock out Mark and put him on this table, and we see him heave him up onto the table, which looks pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a uh, another well done effect. Yeah, he heaves him up onto the table, uh, and he he's gonna get to draining his blood, uh, and he does. <laughs> he drains like ninety five percent of his blood. I, I again, it's not like this movie. I wasn't like going, holy shit! But at least I was like, oh, the quote unquote hero has lost and is now being drained of blood. Didn't see that coming. That's because what you didn't realize was that the true hero is in this next scene, which is oh my Herbert, I, I, his attempts to try to murder this dog, he seems to just have it on a leash as it's pulling him. And he's like, yeah. no, come here, come back. I can't get the hold of this dog. Come back here. I'm just trying to murder you. And at this point, the chief constable happens to be uh, rolling up on the place. And this is all very handy. Good timing. <laughs> and it's just like, hey, what are you doing with that dog? He lets go of the dog. The dog immediately hightails it into the house and down mm -hmm. to the cellar. And they're like, hey, let's follow that dog. I bet he knows what's up. <laughs> For some reason, uh, they're they're aware of this. And uh, <laughs> the dog just runs all the way down to the cellar, and he's barking at the door that's locked. And they're like, there's clearly something back there. we got to get through this door. Now, here's my, my thing. They're, they're pretty loud down in that cellar. Now, granted, it's a cellar. Yeah. But... but Griffin has been cackling and shouting essentially. And there's all the, or at least during the fight, during the altercation, there's plenty of smashing and things like that. Yeah. Bottles Julie's are being thrown. Up, Julie's still upstairs. I assume probably sitting there sipping tea or something. No one's heard this. Nope. And then they rush down there like, well, we might as well let the dog in. I don't know what's up with that. And <laughs> dog seems to really want to get down in that cellar. The dog, they open the door. The dog rushes in. They, they don't actually open the door. They punch a hole through the door so they can't oh, get right. in. But the dog just leaps right through the hole. Yes. And we see now that he, uh, uh, Rob has drained most of uh, Mark's blood because he's mostly visible. Uh, yeah, yes. Which is bad news for him because this dog is right on him. I didn't even need to see him. Dog can smell. And him. I dog thought, I'm watching this going... Is this dog gonna kill him? And I, yeah, he does. I, in a lot of movies, you expect it's like someone goes, "He's got him pinned down," and then they yeah. get him or they have to shoot him. No, man, they get down there, and and Gray Shadow has done the job. Because by the time they actually get, through, the time they actually get through the door, 
the the constable leans down uh at uh uh at rob there and he's just like well uh don't have to worry about the invisible man anymore yeah he's ripped to pieces like <laughs> i and i was again on board for this and then the they dog i can only says- I assume they can only at that moment deputize the dog and he becomes a, an officer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Universal did try to spin this into a weird <laughs> amalgam of its dog adventure movies with its horror films where <laughs> Grey Shadow goes on to tackle all the great monsters. <laughs> Grey, Grey Shadow versus Dracula. <laughs> oh sadly, no, the dog sadly, is coming for me. Sadly, I guarantee you there was a meeting or two about the possibility of this. Yes. They, they decided no. But hey, they uh, did fellas, I just saw it. that new Invisible Man picture we got. There's this dog at the end of it. What if we had that dog fight some of the other monsters? I agree. That dog was fantastic. That dog's got star written all over. Just picture this. It's that dog versus Karloff. Oh, my God. Even better, it's dog versus Wolfman. Dog versus dog. Those are the thrills that'll fill the tills with bills. They'll have to big bi- <laughs> they'll have to build bigger tills to fill all of them. Um, the dog has gotten revenge for the murder of sweet, lovable Doctor Drury. It's an eye for an eye, man, and it is brutal. And then, as justice is, is served, as is almost wrote. Yeah. Then the chief inspector, who I mean, has been a in his what two scenes has been fine he's sort of an authoritarian nice guy yeah they give him the final speech i mean (laughs) this here's the mark wake up we find out mark's gonna be okay yeah they're like oh wait he's still alive julie doesn't run down and go oh my god and they're like his name was actually rob griffin oh my no that never happens (laughs) jasper and irene they don't know what the fuck we never see irene again we never see them again. So instead, it's this side character who has had almost no screen time delivers the he tampered in God's domain <laughs> type speech. It's like also, there's some things that's not, not the him. problem with what he did. No, he that's... was a crazy person. <laughs> he, he, was crazy he was crazy before crazy... the invisibility. He was a yeah. He was a crazy person who got wronged, possibly intentionally wronged Maybe. by. Some Hard to wealth. tell. Hard to tell. Yeah. But what a movie. it's, yeah, it, 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 even it's good ideas. It just doesn't do anything with them. You're like, oh, that could have, no, no, that would have been too much work, I guess, to, to try and make this better. Yeah. And they cranked it out in five weeks. <laughs> it shows. Yeah. Hmm. So then we get this weird coda scene where, uh, Julie and Mark, who's now better, uh, uh, and uh, Jasper are all sitting in front of the fireplace. And they have this weird, jokey, kind of philosophical scene. And wh- and then once again, I'm going, but wait, did Jasper try to murder him? Should I like Jasper? Should I be glad he's still alive? I don't know. You know what? I have a feeling this was a reshoot, like a tacked on thing. Which also would explain why um, uh, Gail Sondergaard, who played Irene, did not show back up. Mm. I have a feeling that she's like, no, I thought I was wrapped and done on this <laughs> thing. So you can have Sir Jasper, whatever the fuck. I don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> you can have Orange Julius. I don't <laughs> I'm out. Because uh, this does have the feel of, of disjointed, just tack on thing. Yeah. Oh, oh definitely. And it is, again, trying to make you feel like for some reason the herricks were innocents in all of this and thank god the monster's been dealt with yeah but it's like number one i like the idea of a movie that's more complicated than that yeah um, sure um and where maybe they i mean in, in that version i feel like they would all go down right the herricks would get killed and griffin would get killed and, and julie would... could still be the innocent and go yeah. oh, oh my god i did not know that my parents were such evil people well, well, spin this around and make julie more of a protagonist where she's realizing wait why is somebody coming after my parents and then she's like if you'd had a moment where she's like oh my god you tried to murder him yeah oh that'd be good stuff mark could figure out some stuff with his reporter skills i look there's a good movie in here maybe stop (laughs) making the movie better because trust me i've been there before it's just a whole i am this close to writing a new draft of this (laughs) 
I would love it if you're like going, is there anyone still alive from that original production office? Because I'd like to get this new draft to them. Not current Universal heads. I want to no, go. No. Direct- Oh is there God. any way I can ma- remake Invisible Man's Revenge? I'll make it with Elizabeth Moss if they want to make that continue, but I'll take the plot strokes of this. And <laughs> You know, strangely, what I would totally be on board for is if they started their Dark Universe by just doing updates of the original films. Not like, here's our bold new reimagining, just mm-hmm. here's our 21st century take on the same material. We just made it better. And then you you weave your way and you correct the mistakes that the original made. But you made make the same these- thirty movies we've been watching, just with modern day yes. sensibilities. Oh, that's an yes. interesting idea. Can you idea. imagine the House of Frankenstein we would get by the end of that? <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty awesome. You're well, you're, that- you're locked into. We have to make this many mummy movies, this many Invisible Man movies. We have to. All right, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> that because might- of the mummy. Then that- you're dealing with like, what happened to Imhotep? Why are we now with Karis? <laughs> Tana leaves. Don't you it? worry about it. Uh, well, you know, Bill Condon was going to remake uh, Bride of Frankenstein as part of the Dark Universe. Yeah. I just don't know why anyone would sign up to do that. Um, I mean, Condon made Gods and Monsters, so clearly he's a whale devotee. But it's just like saying, well, my new take on Citizen Kane is going to be... Well, it is kind of like, why go after the best one? <laughs> yeah, remake true. this. Remake Invisible Man's Revenge. You can definitely improve this. Or remake Frankenstein and blend in the elements of the Frankenstein well, story that became Bride of Frankenstein and make one film out go. of it. Uh, They're short movies. Yeah. You could easily combine those two things together yes. into one big story. Yes, you could. And go back to the original novel. Yeah. And, you know, Didn't Kenneth sure Branagh do that, Kenneth, though? No. Uh, Kenneth Branagh kind of. But, you he know, wanted to. He, he was, he was kind of not the guy. I God don't know, bless him. I don't know but if, if Brana was the problem there as much as maybe De Niro might have been. There were many choices along the way I don't think helped. But at least we got electric eels. Yeah. Um, provide I, the electricity. I don't. I'm, uh, I'm the Frankenstein monster. <laughs> the nice hermit played the violin. He taught me how to talk. He taught me a lot of things. He was a nice man. Yeah, I, uh, I know how to talk. I just uh, choose not to a lot. You and my creator, kind of like my father. All I can say is thanks. Thanks a fucking big deal. Look at this face. No one's ever going to love this, huh? <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you, Frankenstein. <laughs> you know what? I do want to see Martin Scorsese's Frankenstein. <laughs> With oh, Al you think Pacino. This bad? You think this face looks bad? Watch what I do to I yours. I mean, <laughs> it, it's, it's easy, right? De Niro's the monster again. Pacino's the doctor. Pesci's yeah. Igor or Fritz or whatever you want the assistant to be. <laughs> Yeah, I get a hump. So what? What are you? What are you mocking me for? It? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> People say it's wrong. <laughs> Bring the dead back to life. Now I know what God feels like. Ho! <laughs> uh, anyway, this movie. <laughs> sorry, folks. Yeah, it's... Uh, this is hour four of the podcast. <laughs> We're very sorry. We've gone off. Uh, this one's not great. No, this one's not uh, great. It's, it's just. Uh, Slight tick up from yeah. uh, definitely a woman. I still think Invisible Agent has elements that should have worked. Yeah. yeah, they just, none of them ever were as creative or as original or as exciting as that original Invisible Man. No, yeah. so we have one more Invisible Man movie to yeah. go, and it's a comedy, so. Yeah. I like we're... it. I I remember liking it. It's been a while since I've watched it, but I have seen it many times. It's been a long time for me, too, and I don't remember... The Abbott and Costellos, I can remember a little bits, but the, you know, Meet Frankenstein is the one. Yeah. Is, it's A, the funniest of them. Yeah. Uh, but also, it's what you really want. It's the classic dudes, yeah. except, for, of course, Karloff is not playing uh, the creature, but I mean, still, it's the it's, classic creatures. It's my favorite of any of their movies, period, regardless of the monster ones. It's actually yeah. my favorite Abbott and Costello movie. Um, yeah. it's it's such a good Abbott and Costello movie, and it's such a good Universal Monster movie. Weirdly, yeah, yeah, but that's a few weeks away. Yes, that is a few weeks away because guess what? We gotta check back in with our old buddy Karis, aka Lon Chaney Jr. Still just Lon Chaney on the poster, but yeah, uh, we're we're back to Lon and his raggedy pajamas. <laughs> 
and he uh, will lumber all about and speak no words. Yep. But you know, uh, you know who else we have next week again? John Carradine. Yeah, he's back. Yeah. Is Evelyn Anchors in this one? She's not. Oh my god. <laughs> Despite uh, as much, I mean, I know Lon wanted her there, but it just. It I'm just, not doing another mummy unless Evelyn's there because I want to fuck with her for four more weeks. I just want to make her life a living hell. That's <laughs> what I was doing in her in her trailer. It's where I go after all those chili dogs. <laughs> I, I've been I've been Dutch ovening. No, we, trailer we get to we. <laughs> We get to talk about a new girl that Lon, I'm sure, was was great to uh, next week. Uh, for yeah. the 62 minutes that is uh, oh the Mummy's God. Ghost, I'm, I guarantee you right now there will be no ghost. <laughs> <laughs> well, John Carradine's there. That's pretty fucking close. Ghost of Frankenstein. There was no ghost. There was a weird vision. Yeah, uh, we still know what to uh, ascribe to that. There was a but ghostly anyway, vision. That's us next week, and yeah. then. Then after we get over that little hump, well, they're not going to get suddenly better, but we're into some a new interesting strain of Universal horror films. Yes. Um, but yes, join us next week for the Mummy's Ghost. G -g 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 Ghost. Uh, <laughs> yes, and of course, thank you to the patrons for your support. It is greatly appreciated. You're listening to this show through an all new audio interface that you guys paid for, so we appreciate that gratefully. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's going to do it, uh, for this week's episode of Campbell and Jones meet the monsters. I'm John Campbell. I'm Brendan Jones. And remember there are such things as monsters. Fake. <laughs>